Are you a brew head? I'm a brew head. Are you a brew head? I'm a brew head. Y'all a brew heads? Yeah, we brew heads. So pour a glass of craft beer. We can do this. Yeah. What's good, y'all? This is C Certified Brewhead, and welcome to episode 105 of Beer Another Shit, the podcast adjunct series. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been looking forward to this one for a little bit. If you are a triple OG BOS listener, actually a listener, I was about to say viewer, you might recognize one of the gentlemen that I'm going to be speaking with tonight. Uh, we had him on back on episode six of the OG series. We didn't have video until I think it was episode 15, so pre video times. This is taking it way back. Uh, I reconnected with these gentlemen about uh, a month ago here in Ontario, which was a glorious occasion. And uh, it felt only right to uh, have the boys on BOS side as they were gracious enough to have Tiffany and myself on their podcast, which of course we're going to yap about. I'm just going to bring them in because we all want to get stuck into the beers. Uh, guys, please welcome Dave and Zach from Brew Detroit in the building. This is the sexiest podcast I've seen in a while. How are we doing, fellas? Oh, so good to be here. Oh, great. Great to see you guys. So good. Great to see you again. Um, it was an honor to hang with you guys uh, in, um, was it July? or It was August. It was in August. August. August at uh, Badlands after August, you guys yep. did some fantastic pods here in Ontario. So I'm looking forward to hearing about uh, that from your side. Um, we're going to have a great chat. Let's get a beer going first so we can uh, get that shit going. So, what are we starting with, boys? Oh, that doesn't look good on my screen. <laughs> Cerveza Del Rey. There you go. Just got it. <laughs> there she is. Yeah. She's going to. There Broody it is. Brew Detroit flagship. I was pretty excited to try this because uh, obviously, Dave, you posted about this one a bunch. And uh, I knew that this was a, uh, you know, one of the, the main beers that Brew Detroit, you know, bump out there and there's nothing you know i think a lot of people would agree that mexican craft mexican lagers are a uh, a glorious thing um yeah tell us about the beer so cerveza del rey is uh broody trade's baby this is our number one beer by far uh monetarily and also uh production wise uh we do about 1400 barrels alone of this beer um nice. and uh Oh yeah, first of all, let me just give, yeah, cheers. Get a little, fucking cheers, boys. <laughs> Pleasure. Uh, uh, this uh, this this beauty Glorious. is uh, four point two percent ABV. She's a crusher. Yep. Yep. Uh, we get uh, it's slightly sweet from the Munich malt. We don't have too much bitterness. Uh, we use very little bittering hops in this bad boy. Okay. Um. It's, it's definitely one of those beers that uh, has been called uh, one of the beers of summer. Um, there's always a few heavy rotation uh, or names in the rotation in Michigan, at least, for the beer of summer. Cerveza Del Rey is definitely one of those that uh, people consider probably one of their favorite lagers. Um, this beer was, uh, going back to Cerveza Del Rey, the name, mm -hmm. you're looking at uh, us paying homage to uh, the village of Del Rey, south, uh, southwest Detroit, um, right near Mexican town. And, uh, it, it was just, it was an old, uh, an old town that, uh, doesn't really, uh, it's not really doing much right now. Uh, it's not a, really a thing right now, but because of the history, um, with, uh, the, the high, uh, population of immigrants in the, the city, um, this is what this beer is named for. Um, so it's, it's what, it's one of my favorite beers, uh, aside from, uh, it's darker version, which is Cerveza Del Rey Ooh. Oscura. Uh, and so that's good. just the dark version, man. And it's, uh, you know, light, light to medium body. Um, you got that white fluffy head on it. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely one of those beers that, uh, it's a year rounder. It's one of those beers that we have in a lot of the big chain stores. Uh, we got, uh, let's see, Meyer Kroger. Um, those are two of the bigger stores for us here in Michigan, uh, in like in the Midwest. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's in all of them. Uh, and we were, we were able to, you know, grow this brand and let this be the driver of, of what Broody Troy beer is. That's sick, man. Um, I love it. Do you know why you guys chose a Mexican lager for a flagship? 
in a part of the world, which I think this is a cool thing. And, you know, obviously you're in the Northeast. You guys are you know a few hours from here. Gets pretty nippy. Um, you know, why a Mexican lager? I thought that was an interesting choice. So, uh, it, it, first there, we do have in Southwest Detroit, uh, it is, uh, we do call it Mexican town, right? So we're right next door to Mexican town in court town, which is the oldest neighborhood in the city of Detroit, which is, yes. uh, was a heavily, uh, I- Irish neighborhood. So <laughs> between those two neighborhoods, we're just down the street from Mexican town and we're in court town. So that was, that's first. The second one is it was just a bunch of, uh, a bunch of craft beer people who were sitting around watching TV together. And uh, they all looked around at each other, and each one of them was drinking some macro Mexican-style lager. And they were like, all right, somebody needs to do this. And uh, at the time, Rudy Detroit really didn't have a – we didn't have our own brand. Okay. Um, this, this, we were just a contract brewing facility. We didn't have our own brand. And uh, my old boss, Ryan Locke, uh, he and the others decided that, well, Rudy Detroit's going to be the one that – starts doing a, uh, you know, craft Mexican style lager in the state of Michigan. And with the system that we have, we have a hundred barrel brow con system at the brewery. Okay. Uh, that thing is set up no big and deal. designed <laughs> to, brew, to brew lagers. It's, it's a, it's a German system. Like lagers are obviously we brew everything on it, but I mean, that's, that's the, the honey hole right there is, uh, you know, Mexican style lager or lager in general. I love it. So um, I think one yeah, of the just a bunch that, of people sitting around drink, that, drinking a Mexican lager. Well, that's but that's it though. I think that's one of the things that is important when we talk about you hanging out with other craft beer people, right? Like when I hang out, I, I'm not a brewer. I don't work in the beer industry. I'm just an adjunct. But you always find people drinking uh, something light, something crisp, right? So this makes a lot of sure. sense, and I do think it's important. I do think it's important what Dave mentioned about um, the Mexican influence in Detroit because you don't think about it if you're on the outside. Excuse me, but when you like Dave said, when you're in Southwest Detroit, when you're in Mexican Village, I mean, it is so uh, it, it is so ingrained in that whole neighborhood. So, um, you know, I, th- I think it's great. I think it's great. It's plus it's a curveball, like you said. People aren't used to these kind of things being a flagship, and yeah. now that people are going more crispy, uh, you know, they're already there. They already have the lane. I like that, man. I like that. There's a that's a great point. Like crispies are becoming more and more popular in the last. I guess probably two years maybe and it seems everywhere in, in, in different scales but also the fact that this ties in culturally to a neighborhood close to the brewery uh that makes so much more sense to me now um i also would imagine both of you guys might have a perspective on this that like i feel like they're few and far between and when you do get them like when i say them i mean mexican craft mexican lagers and when you do get them i'm all, it's always like a pleasure i feel like it's like I miss Corona, I guess. I really used to like Corona pre-craft days. And this brings me <laughs> back. And it's not shit, which is the one thing I'm like, this can't be back there anymore, like, at all. So <laughs> I feel like these, I was excited yeah, well, to try this. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's the, for Cerveza Del Rey, I mean, Modelo is one of my favorite. Uh, I still, I'll, I'll drink a Modelo right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that's, uh, I love Mexican style. I love Mexican style lagers. And this is, this isn't a beer that's a, that's a sleeper either that people are like, ah, it, you know, it's just a Mexican style lager. This beer, the first time we brewed it and uh, we sent it out to GABF, this beer won a bronze medal the first year we brought it out. Nice. So uh, in the, the, it won in the, the international style Pilsner category, um, bronze medal 2018. So it's, it's not, um, you know, we haven't won a medal since then <laughs> with it, but. Uh, we can always uh, we can always look look at the wall and say you know what we got we got that bronze the first year we did it so love to see it. I've got a special place in my heart for Mexican lagers. I lived in Tucson, Arizona for like eleven years, which is you know right north of the border. And uh, like Dave said, I'll still drink Soul now. Like if you hand me one right now, it would be up and down. So uh, yeah, I think it is. Like I said earlier, I think it's a curveball, mm-hmm. and it's a nice it's a nice refresher because you don't see many of them. And when you do, like you said, it's usually a gem. Yeah, and I guess on paper you associate. Mexican you know what? Lagers. What I find too with the a lot of the Mexican style lagers is that. Sorry, see. No, go please, bro. Yeah, mm-hmm. what I was saying is so with, with the with the Mexican style lagers, a lot of the time what we're seeing is, we have they're already adding flavors to it. A lot of breweries, right? So they're already adding your lime to it 
or they're doing something else to it rather than just a straight up lager. You know, right. there's, they're, they're, they're already adding flavors that they think people want in, in a Mexican style lager without just letting the, the beer speak for itself. And that doesn't mean that it's a bad beer at all. Um, not to me at, at least, um, you know, I'll drink, I'll drink them all. There's, there's a lot in the state of Michigan. Um, you know, uh, I don't know too many that came before surveys of Del Rey. Uh, I know a lot of them that came after it for sure. Um, and that's, that's not to say that they, people saw the success of what Del Rey was, but there's probably some of that, at least to see, you know, there is a Michigan craft brewery that's doing something pretty big with just a straight up lager, um, that, you know, follows the, the Mexican style of, of that style. It's a gateway beer too. You can tell somebody, oh, it tastes like a Corona and they're like, Hey, I like those. And boom, right. Great point, by the way. I feel like, I don't know how you guys feel about gateway beers, but I think they're arguably the most underrated and undervalued beers in craft beer because as beer nerds, we're always wanting the biggest, craziest, next shit. But really what's going to grow the industry is a beer like this. A beer, like you said, Zach, that like is familiar enough, but like elevated in comparison to what they may be used to drinking. Um and it's that those people are what you know what's going to keep the industry going and getting bigger, and therefore you know more money flowing, products are more affordable, etc. And it's just going to make it um, a better place. So these beers that I would say probably don't get the respect they they deserve across the board. And uh, I think this Mexican lager is one that probably doesn't get mentioned enough when you put it like that. I like that shit. I, but I think you're right when it comes to the gateway beers because people like the three of us here and people that are watching likely too because if you're watching this then <laughs> you're, you're definitely probably a nerd <laughs> which is fabulous uh, that that we don't need to be drawn in by the simpler things right and we can't keep the industry afloat by ourselves we do need more people that are drinking the macro to switch to not anything crazy. We're not asking you to drink a double IPA or anything smoothie, or we're just asking you to drink what you're already drinking. But like you said, see, better. Just drink better beer. It's not even that much more expensive. This this Brew Detroit Cerveza del Rey is just like anything else you would find in a macro. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, I think Dave, we got. I think you got a fair bit of a delay between Dave and us. Can you hear us? Okay, Dave. Yeah, let me. Oh, that's a big delay. I can yeah. hear you now. Uh, I'm gonna try to move somewhere real quick. Okay. No problem. Um, and get this situated. That's screwing things up here. Yeah, no worries, dude. Um, everyone's used to it the last two Hold years up. or so. Hold yeah, up. you're right. You everyone's guys, you guys, you guys been... keep. But he's right, though. This is like part of our culture now. You know, it used to be like, oh, sorry. Uh, you know, that was my microwave in the background. Now it's like, oh, <laughs> sorry, my Zoom screen is frozen. Everyone knows what's up, man. It's uh, it's made it a lot easier. I think that's why I know you guys traveled here to do the pod in person, which I think is superior, obviously. But obviously, you know, in the last couple of years, it wasn't possible for the most part. And I'm finding I used to be so against this because I just thought it just wasn't the same experience over, overall. But I found that now it's opened the world. Like, I don't know when, like, I don't have it. I'm waiting for my Canadian passport. It doesn't come for a few months. So... I still can't really go anywhere yet, and that would impede this interview from happening. But I have the beers already here because we hung out a month ago, um, and we're able to you know move straight into to doing the pod virtually. Well, absolutely, know? and I, I mean, I'll be honest. One of the reasons we did it in person is because we just wanted a weekend away. <laughs> <laughs> hey, which I mean, it was, it was great. We we had we had just uh, the best time. And, uh, you know, and a good chunk of that, of course, was the people that we met along the way. And, I mean, it was – we had so much fun. Maybe we can chat about that now before we get into the beer history that we normally would. So, you guys, obviously – I don't know if I even clarified before coming on. But, uh, Zach, you and Dave host the Brew Detroit podcast, which, uh, you know, you guys are, you know, balls deep in right now. It's been going great. You did the couple episodes. I'd love to hear about – let's talk about the podcast maybe for a bit. Um how did that all come about? What have you guys been doing with it? Yeah, tell, tell us about it overall, man. Yeah, and I mean, I'll let Dave jump back in when he's ready to go, but uh, Dave and I met a couple years ago. Uh, I do this for a living when it comes to um, 
podcasting, right? This is this is my normal gig. Um, and before that, I was on the radio. So he and I met, and he had this idea for marketing, and he said, "Hey, uh, what about a podcast?" And you know, I I love working with Dave. I love hanging out. And one of the things that that Dave does with the podcast that I love is it's it's the Brew Detroit podcast. But as you've noticed, see, you were with us. It's not about Brew Detroit really at all. Right. It's about everything else. We'll still talk about Brew Detroit, right? Dave still is Brew Detroit. Wait, which way am I pointing? I always get it wrong. That's why yeah. I can't be a weather person. <laughs> this way. Um, this way. I don't ever know. But but I, I love that. And you know, one of the things that I've been so fortunate to to be able to do over the last few years is to become a part of the craft beer like the 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 back of the house side without actually being a brewer or owning a brewery or working in a brewery and i just i love that community and again when we talk about the the canadian trip all the people that i had i'd never met any of you and before you know we went to third moon and chris and bebo i mean it was we just it was just a riot we loved it that's really cool man um the idea of coming up here where did that come from was it just more like that was Dave's. Go with Dave's idea? <laughs> Yeah, man, I was like, uh, I was like, listen, we got, uh, we can get over the border. Let's do something that, okay, first of all, let's do something that no other brewery that I'm aware of is doing, which is start a podcast. Second, let's take it on the road. Thirdly, let's take it out of the country and just do, like, I'm always about doing, like, let's do some cool shit that we can tell stories about. Like, that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's like the main thing. Like, I mean, now we get to tell the story about like we started this brewery podcast and we decided to go international because why the hell not? It's right. I mean, you know, we're in Detroit. It's uh, we leave Detroit. We're in Canada in 15 minutes. Yeah, which is crazy. You know, like let's let's just go over there uh, because I know they have great beer over there. It's a it's a killer scene, you know, just just from paying attention to all the stuff that uh, that you do. And, and seeing all of the great beer that uh, I think is, is over there and, you know, um, finding out that it is great beer uh, just by going over there, then, yeah, I mean, that, that, was, that was just me, you know, <laughs> let's, let's do some cool shit. That was pretty much it. And I mean, and that's why David and I get along because he says that and I say, yes, yes. right now, let's go. <laughs> let's make it happen. Yeah. He, yeah. he didn't even hesitate. <laughs> he didn't even hesitate. He was like, yeah. No, I mean, we look, <laughs> when we talked, to, we talked about this with the third moon guys, because I think Bebo's from uh, he's an American. He's from Chicago. And yes. we, we and you said it, too. We couldn't we literally could not do this for two years. We could not go no. to Canada. We just couldn't. And for us, not that I spend a ton of time in Windsor, but being Detroiters, not being able to go to Canada is it's unusual. We go to Canada. It's not that far. Like Dave said, I mean, I'm from the border right now. Uh, yeah. Fifteen minutes. So, uh, yeah, so no, I, it was, it was, and I got to say the beer was, I didn't know what to expect. Um, but the hazy, I'm a big hazy guy and the hazy scene, at least at the places where we went, I mean, it was just, it was out of control, especially being there for, uh, the collaboration with the third moon guys. Um, how, what was the name of that bar? Bob there was Volvo. two of them. We were at the one on. Yeah. And I mean, oh, it was, it was so good. It was actually really cool yeah. timing because Dave was telling yeah. me. You want he wants to get. We were planning to do it virtually to have Tiff, my partner, and I on on the pod, and then I think yep. Dave, you just were like, "Yo, like we could just come up there." I was like, "All right, fuck, I'm down." Yeah, when you when you said you guys were coming mm -hmm. over, you know, uh, you know, more towards Toronto, I was like, "Dude," at first I looked at the map, and for some reason the map said seven hours. I was like, "That's not, that's not right." That's not close. <laughs> and then you're like, "No, you're like, no, you're like, no, we're like three hours away." I was like, "Oh, dude, that's <laughs> that's even better," because I mean, you know. For uh for a weekend trip with my family, like we go up to a place called Port Austin in Michigan. That's a three hour drive. I was like, I do that. Uh, I do that almost every other weekend. So, so I was like, yeah, we could we could definitely make that happen. And then I was like, Toronto's only what another 30, 45 minutes away from that. I was like, let's just stay in Toronto. Which is perfect because neither of you had been there, right? No. No. Okay. No. So which I mean, that was the thing. Like you know, we go to Canada, but like when, if if I'm going to a big city, usually we'll go south canada's usually for like windsor or like you know um uh oh man what's the place uh we used to go camping uh with the pinery grand bend okay. um so yeah no i'd never been to toronto before it was it was and it was great we which blast. was perfect because dave was asking me about staying here where we're in hamilton which is about an hour from toronto and i was like look i yeah. love hamilton but i'm like if you guys are coming from there and you need to see something you need to stay in toronto 
and um, when Dave was like, we got time, we, should, we can do two podcasts. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I can connect you with basically anybody. I'm like, do you have anyone in mind? And Dave was like, not really. I don't, we, we threw a few names around. I was like, look, if you're going to come over here, ex- like understanding that if you're going to spend the time, money, and energy to do it, you might as well speak to some of the breweries who are really doing it at like a high, high level that are internationally recognized already as some of the best breweries. As far as, like you said, Zach, you're into Hayes. I, I kind of just assumed because Dave, last time we actually hung out in Michigan, Dave wasn't the biggest fan of it. I kind of assumed you were. You didn't no. push You didn't push back. So I was like, all right, beautiful. So I suggested Third Moon and Badlands because they're my two personal favorites. Is, is, uh, there's others as well, of course. But uh, as far as the, the top tier, I think those two guys are probably doing it consistently uh, the best. And I was like, well, I, you know, I would consider those guys personal friends of mine as opposed to kind of like acquaintances. So I was like, look, if I'm going to recommend them to do the part, I knew they'd be down as shit. Um, so managed to land third moon so you guys went out to milton which is sort of like a suburb i guess of toronto um how was that experience checked out the tap room dead, and dead mouse lives there <laughs> yeah which is hilarious i had no idea until i saw the collapse dude, and then uh, the, that, that that was hilarious dude and then we saw the video of them like at dead mouse's house and fucking tom green was there and i mean it was it was i'm like where where the where the fuck are we right now and it was that was it was wild it was wild but the beer oh and you know one of the things when you have so many options like we do in southeastern michigan and michigan in general it's about the people behind the beer because you have options who do you want to give your money to and like that was what i left with between the two spots we went to badlands and third moon like take all of my money because they were such great people yeah true i mean once uh once i walked into that place i was like this is, this is the the what Rudy Troy would be if we didn't start off as a contract brewing facility. Say somebody just started the Rudy Troy brand and and I was in charge of it. That's what Rudy Troy would be, but with still probably an emphasis on loggers instead of the New Englands. But they do everything good, man. Yeah. Everything that they gave us that we took home, uh, you know their oh. their kill their kill pills kill pills uh, like that. Man, that that shit was so good. Uh, I still have one can left that I've been saving, uh, just just for you know when I want a really good uh, pilsner. Um, but everything kind of else, stout. yeah, everything else. And the uh, we had the uh, God, what the hell's the name of it? Their the their big stout series that they do. Yes, yeah, Patriot stout. Stouts. We had yeah. we had a couple different, and I shared. I took these beers with because they gave us a, a decent amount. I took the all of them to the brewery for all the brewers at Brew Detroit. And shared it with those guys. Uh, I didn't think? want to hoard it all. I, they loved it. Every single one of them. It blew Love their it. minds. Uh, the cin- the cinnamon roll bestowed was unbelievable. It tasted just like a damn cinnamon roll. And a lot of time, you know, you'll have you'll you'll have a, and that's what people expect now. Like if you're going to put something like that on your label or call it that, that's what people were like. If it doesn't taste exactly like a cinnamon roll, don't then, even fucking call it that anymore. Nope, it's over gotta, for them. Yeah, but I mean, well, here's yeah. I, I mean, again, like I'm not a huge fan of uh, of hazies. I will drink them, you know. I'll, I'll drink them, but as you know, my my go to is gonna probably be either a BBA stout, Imperial stout, or a crispy lager. They're two totally different ends of the spectrum. I respect it. I think what one of the things about those guys at Third Moon too is like, and again, I'm not a brewer, so I don't know anything other than I've seen other brew houses their ability to kick out i mean that collab they're like oh yeah you know we're releasing 16 beers and they were so casual i'm like <laughs> yeah from, right. from where <laughs> here he's like yeah we do it all the time and i'm like oh the I, tap takeover right it was the tap takeover yeah, yeah those yeah. guys are but i mean it sounded like they do not to that extent but like frequently they're doing they were talking about an anniversary where they're doing like they had eight or nine yes it's like, I think they had how like, do you do that in that space it was it's yeah, crazy man. They pump and shit. That blew my mind when they were like, "Yeah, we're going to release." It was like thirteen, like thirteen beers in October for their anniversary or some shit. And I was like, "Same, same reaction from Zach." Excuse me. Uh, it was like, "Where, where are you? Wh- how are you doing about. this?" Yeah, they do a uh, their anniversary is in May, and they dropped I think it was eleven or twelve, 
So I got two. I went and saw yep. them before I picked up two of everything. That was a very hefty bill, but more than happy to invest in those gentlemen. And in October, the one you're referring to, they do like a Halloween drop every year. So they'll probably have That's what it was. pumpkin spice uh, bestow, yeah, yeah, you know, there you go. Yeah. Uh, and all that type of fun shit. But yeah, I don't know what the fuck they're doing. Those guys are legitimate beasts. And I thought as well on their branding, I know that that would be something that would be up your alley. So I thought that would be a good yeah. cover. And the fact that also Bebo is from uh, Chicago, like you said, but his uh, family's in Michigan. So there's a big tie-in yep. with you guys. I knew that would be kind of yep. cool for him to just chat with some boys from yep. where he's from. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on all that because I know we were here to talk about Pre Detroit. But so that was a real fun one. And then I want to make sure you guys saw Badlands because they're out on a farm in the middle of kind of nowhere. Um, that was a real fun experience, man. I I, I, I really <laughs> enjoyed hanging out with you guys there. We got to sit in their beer bus and uh, and do the pub with Tiff and I, and then Troy from uh, Badlands came and joined us for probably about half of it, a little more, which was great. I feel like we had some really cool conversations, though. The convos were dope. Like, we got kind of real. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, – so for Badlands, that podcast, for the Broody Troy podcast, I'm going to drop that tomorrow. Only nice. reason why I'm dropping it tomorrow is because we had, we had Depth Day uh, – or not Depth Day, I'm sorry, the 140 release today. Uh, which oh, is our club. our membership? Yes. Yeah. So we uh, I dropped that today. I didn't want anything to um, you know n- not drive the sales to get because uh, we only had fifty six people not renew right. So now we only have fifty six memberships to fill. Uh, so that was today, but tomorrow we'll drop that. Um, one more thing about uh, about Third Moon, and that's that the the same wavelength that Chris and I we're on about how we approach our brands. He said the craziest shit. He said the oh. same exact thing that I said, that I say to everybody. And that's, uh, he said it the same way. It was really fucking weird, man. He goes, and hey, when everybody else is going this way, we're going to go that way. And I was like, I say the same fucking thing all the time because it keeps people guessing. It keeps things fresh and new. Oh, yeah. And by the time people catch up to where you are, you're already going the other way again. So it's, it's people playing catch up with, with what you're doing. So there's that. And then the other thing is I was talking Just to, to get, Zach. One, tell the other story. One, yeah. Yeah. One thing that I've always, I wanted to, not always, that I just started wanting to do with Broody Detroit is because uh, recreational uh, cannabis is legal in, in, in Michigan. And I was like to capitalize on that because there's such, we're, we are losing uh, business to the cannabis, um, uh, uh, I guess, area or, you know, space. Um that market we need we yeah the market thank you thank you that's why Zach, that's why you're my my right hand guy zach <laughs> <laughs> uh, clutch so <coughs> it, it, i was like i want to get cones i want to get papers i want to get all kinds of shit and then without saying any of this to to be or chris chris leaves and he goes back and he hands us two little boxes i'm like zach i swear to god if this is a grinder and we open up the boxes and they're third moon grinders. I was Fucking like, grinder. we're on this, we're on the same wavelength, man. Everything that these yeah. guys do is, are the same things that I'm thinking. So I, I, one, I love the fact that that's the case. The feel of their brand is, is almost what we were going for with through Detroit. Obviously it's, um, I don't have the luxury of going full on like what they do because it's not my brewery. Uh, even though I kind of treated it like, uh, like it was for the last three and a half years. Um, I just really uh, respect and admire those guys for one, how hard they work, their ideas and thoughts, and, and what they put into action. So that was the last thing I want to say about Third Moon. So tip of the cap to you, Chris and Bebo, and the rest of the crew over at Third Moon. You guys are the shit. And Love we hung it. out with them the next day too. We hung out with them both days. <laughs> yes, at the <laughs> at the uh, event, right at, at Vola. Yeah, right? yeah we sat there. That, that was on, uh, and uh, David and I had a blast, and we can get to Badlands because that was amazing, but. Walking up and down College Street was a blast, and then going to the Tap Takeover, it was, it was just, it was great. But I mean, Badlands, you know, I grew up in the country, so that 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 scene that of of you know Rolling Hills and uh, farmland is is not something that's going to phase me much. But those farms don't have breweries on them; they're fucking farms. And so, like <laughs> that was it was the coolest. It was just the coolest thing. I mean. Not only the where you show the like the original 
uh, like shed where he was selling beer to begin with. <laughs> but then like he's like, you know what? I don't want to drive to work. Fuck it. I'll build my house right here. I'm like, all right, that's great. <laughs> and, and then, you know, you got to wear mud boots. You got to wear mud boots like you're on the farm because you are to go to uh, the brew house. And we're walking around in this barn like drinking the best. It was their anniversary, too. So we had some of their very best stuff. And I mean, just right out of the. Uh, that was so dope. And the bus. The bus, the Tabernacle <laughs> Choir bus, it was amazing. Yes, we got to try yeah, the uh, anniversary at the tanks, which is dope. Very yeah. fun. That's always fu- that, that's always fun, man. Any, anytime I take somebody into the brew house or back of the brewery, I'm like, "What's in the tanks, and what can I pull out to see how it's tasting?" And uh, you know, just do, it's a really cool experience to to go through too when you have, especially people who, um, you know, for us we've been we've been a brewery before, but. Um, you know, anybody who's never been in a brewery, they're like, oh, you mean like you're going to pour this right out of the tank and give it to me? Yeah, go ahead. Drink yeah. it. Yeah. And it was <laughs> killer. It was, yeah, that was, that was dri- very cool. Go. Dri- driving up to, um, when we were driving through all the farmlands to get to Badlands, I was like, you know, <laughs> C told me this was, this was like on a farm. And I was like, you know, maybe it's just like in the country. And I'm like, this is, there's nothing out here. And then we see like this one, uh, just farm with a house and a, and a couple barns. And I'm like, holy shit, this is it. And, uh, you know, just walking up to it and just, you know, seeing what the lay of the land looked like. And then, you know, getting in there and, uh, getting some smash burgers from Troy's oh, mother-in-law. Oh, those were so good. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, grabbing some beer from, the outside uh, beer garden and and, and that guy and was wailing music. on the guitar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the live, the live music. Like it was. Uh, I was like, man, this is. I, I've I've never been anywhere like that here in Michigan or anywhere else, to be honest with you. Um, and I was like, this is probably one of the coolest spots that I've ever been as far as you know consuming beer. So th- thank you for sending us to yeah. that specific spot. Oh man, I, I mean I've. Go no, sorry, no, please, please. Oh, no, I, no, 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 no. I, I've been to. There's a a place in Northern Michigan called Farm Club. It's in Traverse City. Yeah, yeah. And uh-huh. it's it's similar, but the farm, the barn is like you know they've done stuff to it. It's a restaurant. This I, I was I was so impressed. So much effort goes into tap rooms, and I understand why people need to sit somewhere to consume your alcohol. Unless you're them, they don't care. They're barely open. <laughs> There's nowhere to sit. It's inside, really. I mean, they had that greenhouse, but it was a thousand degrees in there. It was so loud and it was raining. But I was like, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I don't care what it feels like in here. I don't care what the weather's like outside. Nope. I want this burger, this beer, and that guy playing the guitar right now. It was amazing. I'm so happy to hear that that's how you guys felt about it. Like, I knew that if you're going to come this way, I just wanted you guys to see those two places. And that's why I wanted to do our pod there and i thought it was a cool addition because i I, we you know troy is a real thoughtful guy um i don't know he's good friends like with bebo and chris and they all went to yakima uh at the harvest season last year to pick this year's hops and stuff i'm not sure if they went back this year or not actually no Cali now. yeah you're right i saw people was posting about being in yakima perfect because he was in cali like a few days ago so you're right as of as of this so I'm really glad that y'all got to experience that and hang out with Troy and try the haze. Like Bebo was, like I said to Troy, he didn't know that, but Bebo told me before that he thinks Troy does the best haze, period, like out of anywhere. So I was like, all right, if I want y'all to see like the best of what, of the things that, if you would bring anything back to Michigan, the things that maybe people would get mo- most excited about. Um, and that's just scratching, obviously barely scratching the surface, just two breweries out of hundreds here. So, um, you know, it's. Uh, I think it's a great beginning. I'm really happy that um, that you guys uh, got to do that shit. You know, so oh, it was so fun. It's, yeah, go on. Yeah, I, I was gonna say. I, I think one of the things that Zach and I mentioned multiple times to each other was like, yeah, those were New England style IPAs, but like the color that of Troy's New England's, I've never seen anything like that murky out of anything that I've ever seen in, in the, in the U S I'll even, I'll go as far as saying I, that, oh, that was, shit was cream the, corn, dude. It was, it was <laughs> wild. <laughs> the wildest. Yeah, exactly. The wildest color I've ever seen in New England style IPA. I was like, that's, that, that, he almost got it almost like pure white. 
That shit was wild. <laughs> that was wild. The haze he gets is like that, like you said, cream corn, yellow milk. Just that. That's. I don't think I've ever had a beer of his that isn't that color. Yeah, um, I mean it's it's exceptional. It's impressive. Stuff. Yeah, man, it's it's really yeah. really great stuff. So I'm glad that y'all got to. If you're gonna go somewhere, you want you know. I like I remember when we were at the Michigan 2017, the uh, Ypsilanti uh, Craft Beer Festival there, uh, and trying big the big one. Um, we got the media passes, so you get to get in there that hour early. The line was huge. Dave took us up in the fucking um, the, the pedal car, like it was, yeah. it was it was great. And then we he Dave introduced us to Old Nation. Uh, at the time, we were like grabbing onto any haze we could because it was essentially non-existent for the most part in Canada. Um, so we were looking for that for the most part, you know, like whatever we could get. And I was very very impressed with you know everything we had. Old, uh, but was it called Old Tweed or Old Tweed? Boss Tweed. Boss Tweed. Boxer or something, and uh, oh, they don't they don't do that one anymore. They don't do that, okay. And no. then M forty three. Yes. Let's see M forty M forty three Boss Tweed, Boxer, and you might have had Cart Horse. I don't think so. I think there was three. No, I have a yeah, really okay. fairly strong it, it memory because it was imprinted because it was such rare. It was such rare. <laughs> I I remember I did a song called Hazy after that, and I did the music yep. video, and I had one can left. So for the music video at the very end of it, I got to crack it and drink those words. Rapper for yeah. Michigan oh, yeah. Craft Beer. So um, no, it's good. So okay, do you want to? Now I'm looking at the time. Do you want to go into the next beer? We'll get into that, and yeah. then we'll. We'll go back to where we all, uh, where you guys got into beer. Sure. So, which one was next? Yeah, y- y- Yumtown. Yum Town. So this is a Yum Town. Yeah. Un- unique beer. We're uh, we're staying in the crispy realm for this one, but we're gonna add a little bit of fruit to it. So uh, yeah, tell us about this one, fellas. So we got uh, Yum Town, which is a cherry lime lager. Uh, Michigan Tart Cherries from King Orchards in Traverse City. Traverse City is known uh, for the cherries. Um, there's a cherry festival. Yeah, cherry up capital there. of the world, baby. So I mean, it, if you're gonna, yes, exactly. Is it really? If you're gonna get, yes. oh yeah, shit, that's pretty serious. Yeah, if you're if you're gonna get cherries in Michigan, you you should be getting them from Traverse City, especially if you're gonna put them in a beer like this. So, um, yeah, Michigan Tart Cherries, Key Lime. Uh, lager base. It's a light American lager base. Um, you get a little bit more of the lime than you do cherries, uh, but mm-hmm. the cherries do come through. Um, and this one here, again, is, is probably our second flagship. Uh, so we got Cerveza del Rey, Yum Town, and one that we're not trying uh, is a hazy. It's Cloud 19. I've uh, had that. Cloud 19, New, New England style IPA. Yep, you have. Um, that's our third flagship. Back in the day. So this is our second. Okay. This this one here is definitely in the same realm as uh, Cerveza del Rey. It's in all the bigger box stores um, in Meyer Kroger, and then a few of the other ones as well. All righty, boys, get in. Here. Cheers, cheers. So I'm getting a ton of lime on the nose, like you guys are saying. <laughs> the cherry is obviously kind of painted, even though it kind of looks like a hazy um, lager kind of situation. The lime is super strong. But the yeah. combo works like – is this like actual fruit or is it like natural flavors? I no, guess you it's said fruit. It's real fruit. I thought so because you were saying cherry capital yeah. of the world. So like why would you – Oh, fake cherry? <laughs> if you use fake cherries, they'd run you out of town. Like that's not – that's not acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> one of, the lime mean, is the so like, refreshing. My God. Well, that's it. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. one of the things I like about the Yum Town is Dave and uh, the folks at Brew Detroit – have done other things with the Yum Town, right? There's a okay. seltzer that is delicious, right? So like it's it's a little versatile. In fact, I'm not a huge seltzer guy, but that one it's, it's like great. candy. It's right. ridiculous. So you're yeah, saying, this... oh, I, little yum. I'm checking this out now. Little yum. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, little yum. Yeah. Which is also lime yeah, and little... uh, cherries. It's the same same Ooh. ingredients as what we use in even looks similar. in Yum Town. Okay. What's it's so good? I, I it's look. I'm with you, man. Like I don't really have a ton of uh, <laughs> seltzers, but I'm I'm genuinely not mad at them. Like I I enjoy them. I guess it's just too many good beers to drink, so I don't get to them very often. But when I do, it's usually a good time. The fr- I say, fr- tell me what you think of this fruited lagers. 
aren't the most common thing in the world. What's the response to something like this being? I mean, I imagine it's very positive being that it's genuinely a great beer. The fruits work perfectly because I really think this could have gone either way. Um, yep. But they work. the lime is just impeccable because it, once again, brings you almost back to that, you know, lime in the Corona neck type of situation. Um, and it just works gloriously. So what's the, what's the vibes with people? Are people like, I guess, is this attracting a different market? Then maybe some of the other stuff like is this more of a gateway too, or is it just like a fun, excuse me, fruity summer beer or something? Or this one is it used to be uh, we used to release it in the spring, and then because we got it in the big box stores, it turned into a year round beer gotcha. because we had to keep it stocked on the shelves. But the the response to this beer is, I mean, it's everybody, men, women, uh, older people, younger people, people who, for, for speaking of gateway beers, for this one. It's really interesting because you get a lot of people who are like, oh, I drink wine. I don't mm. drink beer. And then no matter who that person is that says that, I'm like, there are a lot of things that I could probably give you right now. But the only thing that I could tell you is if you like, you know, uh, one, of the, one, do you like fruity wines? You know, do you like, do you like wine that has a, has a, a, a lot of fruit notes to it? Um, you know, deep, uh, you know, dark cherry pit uh, type, type wines and stuff like that. And I'm like, all right. Mm. Why don't you why don't you try this one? It's a little on the sweeter side, um, uh, so if you like if you like dry sweeter wines, um, you might like this one. And a lot of the time, people are like, "Holy shit, I do like this." And I was like, "See, you do like beer. You just haven't had the right one yet. This is it." So okay. I mean, I wouldn't give this to say somebody who's like a uh, you know high life drinker, uh, like religiously. I wouldn't give this one to that person. Uh, I gotcha. would probably give them a Del, a Del Rey or we have a, a, a straight up blonde ale called Camp and Beer. I'd give them one oh, of those two for so sure. So good. Uh, this Call is it golf and beer. This is you know. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Golf and beer. Camp and beer is all the G dropping activities. Uh, <laughs> kayak and beer. Bowling beer. Like it's. <laughs> I feel the vibe. It's it's. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, uh, but I mean, this is one of those beers where it's it, it can be the gateway it can introduce somebody into something completely different that they're not used to um and, and kind of open their eyes up to like oh man like craft beer isn't just like yellow fizzy stuff or super cloudy new england style uh, style ipas um but i mean there's there's a style for everybody it's just that that i i really feel this there's a style for everybody they just haven't had it yet agree oh Dude, there are way too many styles of beer for somebody to be like, I won't drink any of these things. Yeah. Like my son's right. mo- my son's mother my son's mother hates beer. But if you find her something like a founder's rubeus, all of a sudden beer's not so bad. Again, you gotta it's it's crazy, is she gonna, right? yeah. is she gonna range far out of that? No. But it, it's there. It exists. And I think with this one, one of the things I really like, because I like intense flavors. I'm a big flavor. Like I mean, like grab my tongue, twist it around, box it a couple times. But usually to do that, you have to drink something a lot bigger, right? Yeah. A fruited sour or a really heavy IPA. This, you get the crispness. That everybody loves the crispy boys, right? But also the flavor is really intense. And so you get this nice balance of uh, drinking a lager while also having it feel like maybe a fruited sour or mm. some kind of big IPA with a bunch of adjuncts in it. And again, there's the, the adjuncts are fruit. It's not anything... Uh, you know, manufactured or I mean, from the consumer side, that's what I feel. Yeah, yeah. I definitely agree. And I'm starting to get the, uh, I think Dave, you might've said before about a candy vibe in this. I'm starting to get that in like, while I'm just sitting here, letting the aftertaste resonate a little bit and you get that little smacky, but not like overly sweet. It's just, it feels like you almost like you had a cherry and a little squirt of lime in your mouth or something yeah. like that. Like yeah, it's, it's like you, like you get that feeling that you chew, you chew the cherry, even with the pit and everything like that. Because what, uh, if brewers are using cherries, they're not using the, the sweet cherries. They're using the tart cherries. Yes. And um, that's that's because it, it offers a, a, just a better flavor. Um, Same thing with what pie. A, what a, yeah, exactly. So uh, we're using the tart cherries instead. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that some brewers would use a sweet cherry for, for whatever reason. But uh, there was a, a brewer that I used to work with at Arbor Brewing Company. His name, uh, his name is uh, John Wagner, probably one of the the best brewers that I've ever come across in the state of Michigan. He's now at Bell's. Um, 
he uh, he actually he was the one that was talking to me about using tart cherries instead of sweet cherries. And he said it just the the sugars uh, offer um, a, the flavor is way better, and then the sugars that are in tart cherries um, are, are better for yeast consumption as well. So it's you get a lot of different things from using tart cherries than what you do the sweet ones. Hmm. That's great. I love it. And no one knows better than, uh, is it Traverse City? T-R-A-V-E-R-S-E, -E, right? I've seen that before. Yep. Yeah. Traverse City Cherry. Cherry Town. Love it. Um, Traverse City. Yeah, buddy. Here for it. So, 45 minutes in. Let's get to your story. Normally we do that literally first thing. It's hilarious. Um, how, I mean, like, let me just position it then. For those who have been listening for a while, you probably know, but, uh, and when you listen to the Brew Detroit pod, you hear the whole history because that'll come out before this. The um, Dave and I met probably pretty close to 10 years ago. It must be around 2013-ish, something like that. Um, we just became mates when you had a, uh, a a business, I guess, called Good Pour, where you were doing craft beer events and things like that. We connected online, yeah. um, along with Phil from Brewheads. Uh, unfortunately, he closed Brewheads down. I guess it must have been pretty tough to, to run all that stuff. He's got a family and things, so I get it. Um, so we all kind of like connected in the, oh, look at that Brewheads glass. Look at that. It represents and um yeah basically we've known each other for years it's always always kept in touch in 27 i know 2015 we had you on the podcast as the first sort of international guest you even bought a, a bluetooth mic just for it and we had scott and i at my brother's house in toronto uh filming there back when we before we got the portable mics excuse me and um so that was back in the day that was just you as good poor before you were even really working in beer if i'm not mistaken then yeah, that's it. 2017, like I mentioned before, Scott, uh, Tiff, and I went down to Michigan uh, for the festival primarily, uh, but we did a bunch of pods when we were down there, um, which was super fun. Um, just a really cool experience. Um, it was one of my favorite beer festivals ever. I, I, Tiff and I were telling you guys when we were hanging out that it was just like, no one got too fucked up. We had beers before. We had beers after. Normally, beer festivals, you get there, and, and everyone's like, off the head by the end of it to the point where it's not really much fun after that. Whereas like, this was just like, it was like the pacing of it was perfect. The weather was amazing. Um, there were people who knew the podcast. We never thought we'd see people who knew the podcast at the time in Michigan of all places, which means like, all right, we're making an impact here. This is cool. So like, it was just a really dope experience and you made it a genuine pleasure. Like you really treated, you just hooked it up. Cause we stayed, where we stayed, we stayed in a hotel. Yeah. We nearly died in the Uber. That was pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> people should check the Welcome blogs. to Detroit. Right? Fuck, man. <laughs> check. To, <laughs> Welcome to Detroit. That could be the episode, man. Um, you know, check out the, the vlog. We've got the vlog on the YouTube channel. It's definitely worth it. It was a fun vlog to watch. So, obviously, we hadn't seen each other since then. So, that's five years. Um, and then it was really cool to reconnect and, and then, obviously, meet Zach and hang out. Like, we connect, connected immediately. It was like, uh, you know very uh obviously i knew if you're zach if you're mates with dave i knew we'd be all on the same vibe same as you guys would be Bo and chris and, and troy and stuff like that so we're all the same type of cats um i'd love to hear that was just the positioning so you know we know but zach and i only met last month so but zach i love your social media presence by the way dude i've been mean to tell you i like the you're just fucking all over everything your tagging game is a1 you, you, from Twitter to Instagram to Facebook, like you just, I don't know, it's, I, I love it. I just like the way you present everything. So much love for that. It's great. It means a lot. Thanks, brother. I, I appreciate you. You're going to fuck around, which obviously I love being the day you're going to fuck around. You've been a marketing dude for time. And I know you take the audio stuff seriously, Zach, and handling social in this real, just like, just like attention to detail. That's what I like about it more than anything. Cause most people don't do that. Even as much as like capitalizing sentences, all the small things, I'm just like, this fucking guy, man, he knows himself. I love it. So, with that, I'd love to hear from both of you, whoever wants to go first, how you individually got into beer, like discovered craft beer, and what that story was, and then how that led you essentially to Brew Detroit and the podcast and, and, and the brewery in and of itself. Take it, Zach. Dave. I want you to go first. No, I want uh, you to go first because actually, <laughs> you and I, you and I have never had this discussion before. Uh, as far as your craft beer, uh, you got oh. into it, uh, has gone. Like I, we, we haven't had this conversation before. So like the only, my, my introduction to you and craft beer was the first time you interviewed me. And, uh, like, I don't know be, before that. So I want to say, uh, 
we'll call it uh, BBD, so before Brew Detroit. <laughs> uh, I have I have no idea what yours was. So that me, C and I will be your audience and, and figure out what the hell, how you got started. Floor is yours, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, uh, that's a, it's a great question. I mean, and one of the things about being here in, in Southeastern Michigan and Michigan in general is that there was some exposure to craft beer early on, not heavily, but I mean, uh, Bell's is older than I am. So you're okay. in a position where one of the greatest breweries in the world is right there and has been around. So things like I can remember going, there's a, there's a university right by um, where Bell's is and Oberon day was a big deal back before it was widely available. You go get a keg and people are, you know, pounding Oberon's, which for those that don't know, similar to a blue moon, but way better. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and then I think it's like Ghetto Blaster from uh, Motor City oh, Brew Works. I mean, that's yes. been around for a long time, right? You get that English, that that English smoothness. I remember but that. for me, uh, for but through all that, I was still as a younger person uh, into the macro. I was doing sports talk radio in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, one of the salesmen was like, "Hey," you know, he was big into craft beer, and he's like, "Hey, I've got this thing," and I'm like, "All right," um, and it paid, and I'm like. Sweet. Uh, and it was, it was called Tales from the Keg as opposed to Tales from the Crypt, right? Cool. And it was, a, it was a thing where breweries would pay uh, to have this segment that would go onto the website and then it would go on through the, the, over the air as well. And the, the model itself, it was a good idea, but asking small to mid-sized breweries to spend radio money is not a good idea. It's just not, it's not feasible. It's not something that you can sustain. But... When I left Tucson and came to Detroit, which I grew up here, um, we needed a, I, I worked at, I do still work at a news, uh, a news radio station and we have what are called features and they, they play it's usually one or two every hour and they're a minute long and they're different. Sometimes it's about education, but they're, they're, the subject matter stays the same. So there'll be an education feature and they wanted a lifestyle feature. And I thought about the thing that I had done in Arizona and I suggested that we do that here, but instead of having people pay, you just go and do it, right? You're not going to get brewers for the most part. If, if I had to ask people, uh, and, and, you know, places like Brew Detroit, they may have been able to do it, right? But most, and again, their situation is unique because of the commercial brewing facility. Yeah. Um, so we started doing that. Uh, so the, the, the first one for me was 2014 when I was in Arizona. And then when I came here in 2018, I've, started doing it similarly but a little bit different um and that's how i met dave and that's how i met almost everybody here um and kind of become part of the scene there are and that's one of the things about detroit the school is i'm not the only one there is more than one journalist that is paying attention to these kinds of things here i mean guys like brian manzullo um so i mean that that's kind of my my introduction was um not about beer it was about an opportunity to do something different and it turns out that, you know, not only the beer is delicious, but the people are great, too. So mm. I've been lucky to do this in, in two places, both in Arizona and here in Michigan. That's sick, man. I love that. So right now you're working full time in radio. That's your. Aside yeah, from the, brewery, so you the podcast. On, you know, on the right, yeah, yeah. So, well, I mean, I, I've been on the radio for the last uh, 10 years, but about uh, nine months ago, our company launched a, a, a podcast department division. And so now I head that up. And I, I podcast daily. I have a daily news podcast. So, um, you know, and every once in a while, and, and Dave will tell you, I work my ass off to sneak in as many beer stories as I can because why wouldn't I? <laughs> it's, Hell yeah. It's, it's, That's crazy, man. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome, yeah. dude. Thank That's you. cool. You, you'll like this too. See, the, I think that the episode before our first encounter uh, during the pandemic uh, did, uh, was Steven at Batch. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sick. Which I know because yeah, of you. So, Right, exactly. So, like, he, um, I don't remember how it happened if, if Stephen gave you my contact information, but I remember you reached out, and I had seen the craft beer conversation that you, or listened to the craft beer conversation that you did with Stephen, and I was like, damn, man, I hope that fucking guy asked me to, you know, be on this show, and then next thing you know, I, I, I think I got a, a call, I don't remember no, what I it was, message on Facebook. you're like, nah, that's what it was, that's what it was, and then uh, I remember we said, both in masks, <laughs> sitting like I've got pictures. A couple, couple tables apart, mm. looking at each other and doing this, this interview. And uh, I was like, man, that was that was cool as hell. And then 
we just became boys from there. It was like, when I came up with Brew Detroit podcast, I was like, yo, um, I need you for two things. One, I need you to be a co-host because I haven't done journalistic shit since college. And two, you have all the equipment, so let me pay you for all of that. He's like, let's do it. <laughs> when did yeah, and he's like, and yeah, that's... man. Same, same, same thing about going to going to Canada. He was like, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. Let's go. <laughs> Zach is a yes man. Yeah. What about um? When when did it start? When did the podcast start? The our first episode was podcast? January. Oh fuck! Like yeah. this year. Yeah, yeah. yeah we j- we started in January and uh, uh, we'll be releasing it. I wanted to try to get. We got caught. We had to get caught up because we we missed a we missed a little bit of time there. Fucking Dave um, almost died so had, and shit. Yeah, um. <laughs> it was it was uh it was it was dumb. Like I you know I didn't try to, but <laughs> it was uh Fair yeah it set us back set us back a couple months, and uh, so we we got caught up. So I wanted to try to release uh, this Badlands one uh, here in September. That way we had nine months nine episodes so um we're, we're at least caught up with that so that's the uh, i'm glad zach came, became a part of it um i you know to be honest with you it would have been really easy for me to as i figured out and knew it would have been really easy for me to just record this shit on my phone but i mean i knew it would be way more fun if zach was there with me so um i was like yeah man let me let me do this and then i put it last year in my marketing budget to pay for 12 episodes Actually, it was a little bit more. I put, I, I put it in there for a little bit more than, than 12. I think I did like 15 episodes just in case and put it in the Smart. budget and then it got approved. Got approved. And I was like, all right. Let's go. I, I, I got the money approved, man. Let's go. Very cool. I, I remember when you told me you were going to do the Brew Detroit podcast and I immediately thought that was just such a cool idea. I, I've only seen at most maybe two breweries do podcasts that – and kind of like what Zach was talking about earlier, like it's a Brew Detroit podcast isn't really about Brew Detroit. Like it's not like a, a, prom, a promotional sort of arm for the brewery because that's no one's going to care about that. Like obviously you're going to talk about no. your stuff, but you're having real conversations with people in the beer industry. Then it just happens to be ran by people who work with Brew Detroit and sort of have that branding. Um, it's a lot, a, a lot of the time Zach has to remind me to talk about Brew Detroit. <laughs> like, hey, I mean, I just about- – uh, we. we we just get caught up in the conversation with people, and then he's like, "Hey, uh, anything going on at Brew Detroit? Uh, you should probably talk about it at some Dave, point." That's a professional <laughs> I mean, right there. And that's one of the things that's so great, though. And I've mentioned this before about the scene here in in Metro Detroit specifically, but I mean, it stretches all the way across Michigan out to Grand Rapids, where the beer is just fantastic. But the the community itself of people that make beer and sell beer is tight. It's tightly knit, and so those podcasts are super organic just like this one is for the same reasons like the competition level that's one thing that always surprises me about brewers especially in this area like you think you're all fighting for the same piece of pie and you are but it doesn't have that same feeling and so the podcast is is just naturally entertaining for that reason alone that these people are friends with each other there is no competition they're collaborating with each other they're sharing ideas and they understand that what's good for one it really is good for all of them nobody is stealing customers from anybody we're 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 lifting up the entire industry and that's and and they understand that and i don't know how it is other places i live here so i can't comment but um you would think that with the amount of people making beer there's almost 500 breweries in michigan that shit would be cutthroat and look every once in a while and dave can tell you stuff happens right people get mad but the amount that you would think it would happen is far, the occurrences are far fewer than, than I would have guessed. I mean, because I'm super competitive and like, fuck you, you know, like I'm putting this beer on this shelf. You're not. I am. But somehow it's not like that. And I'm still not quite sure I can figure out how that works because, again, weird, there's well, only so let, much. I, I yeah, there's only so much space. You're right. Break it down, David. So when, you, when, we go, when we go into these accounts, we know that. One, one, yeah, absolutely. All of us are friends, um, you know, with, you know, a few pe- people who may have like personal issues with certain people, but it's, it's not like it's that big of a deal. But when we go into these accounts, we're not, we're just trying to get our shit on the shelves or on taps. Right. And we're not going in there and saying, Hey, you should take off so-and-so's beer and put ours on. You know what I mean? And like, it's like, you do your best 
to pitch your beer and hopefully you pitch it well enough to where they agree to put it on and whatever they take off is that's that's what they take off and it's their decision and a lot of the buyers here in Michigan um, are, are really educated on one how their sales are with their draft system and stuff like that so what they're replacing your beer with is probably the thing that's not moving the, the best um, which I'm not going to blame anybody if, if like if one of my beers gets taken off and it's not selling at a specific place for something that could sell. I mean, you just you just move on and go to the next one, but you're not going well, off plus there. You don't, you don't want old beer come out of the tap anyway, right? If your beer's not moving, get yeah. rid of it. Let's go. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. That's Savage Yeah, that's that. that Yeah, for sure. That's that's exactly the way it is. Like I'm, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to look at these accounts and saying, well, I mean, this beer's not doing well right now, but we can go in there and try to sell them something completely different. Um, mm. with, with, you know, so it's, it's not, we're, we're never going in there and targeting a specific brewery um, or, you know, trying to, you know, uh, cause problems with people uh, or other breweries and just to, just to get our beer in there. Like there's there, it is tight space. There are a ton of breweries as Zach mentioned, but it's not like you're going in there uh, like an asshole and, and trying to, you know, take somebody's space. You're just mm. going in there trying to sell because, but the reality is everybody's got, uh, you know, sales goals that they have to hit. You know, they have, they have to hit a certain number for, you know, their CEOs or bosses or, uh, you know, somebody who's above them. And it's, it's no hard feelings at all uh, unless you find out that somebody's out there doing exactly what I'm saying we don't do. Then there's a problem. I would hope they would. I would hope they would. At least in craft, I would imagine that it would be unlikely. But it is Very a common- unlikely. It is very common to sort of what you were talking about before, Zach. Like it is, I feel like everywhere I've ever gone, every time I've been, like literally anywhere, I couldn't think of one place it didn't happen. And as soon as you tell my yeah, we're from wherever, we're from Canada, or whatever, like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, how long are you in town for? Okay, are you going here? Have you been here? Are you going there? Like I remember being at fucking the first trip before we knew each other, me and Scott, my old co-host, went to uh, Detroit in like 20, I want to say 2012, 2011, or, no, 2012. And we went to, is there a brewery called like Liberty Street or something like that? There was. Yeah. It's gone now. It's, it's gone. Limit. Yeah, right. There was. Ran- there was, yes. That is fucking random. Yeah. <laughs> I remember being random. sitting at the bar. We ordered a bunch of flights and, you know, doing the little selfie thing. And Scott was doing it at the time with me. And then the bartender, I think was the owner or the brewer or something, was like, oh, what are you guys doing? I'm like, oh, yeah, we do this 365 sure. days of beer thing. Yeah, then very interesting. It felt like a local bar. It was kind of weird. And uh, yeah. we were telling them what we were doing, and they were like, "Ah, oh, cool! Did you try this?" We're like, "No, we didn't." I brought us like another taster of that. I'm like, okay. It's like, oh, where else are you going? I'm like, yeah, we went to um, the one you said before with the Ghetto Blaster. Was that called Motor City? We went there. Motor City Brew Works. We went to Detroit Brewing. I still have like the. It's over here somewhere. I have like the. I got the little paper bag from it, which I had on my wall for years. Um, we went to fuck. Where else we would have gone to in Detroit? In this was your first one, right? Before Summer Beer Fest. Yeah, 2012. So we would have... Yeah. And it was cold. It was probably like April or something. And I think yep. we hit up those two... Where else did we go? What's that other place? Went to Arbor Brewing Company. That's why we knew it when you worked there. Went to Ann Arbor to do that. We went yeah, to... Yeah, you were in Ann Arbor when you went to that. Yep. Yeah. Um, there was another well, that place... Would explain, that would explain Plymouth then. Yep. And then the... Liberty. Somebody, Liberty. Okay, that's probably why. Yeah, we're probably looking at that. And then there was a fucking place. We went past the Wolverine State with the big blue and yellow M thing. And then there was a yep. brewery that had a beer called Wolverine, like a dark lager. Yeah. What was that place called? Yeah, that's w- Wolverine Brewing Company. Oh, there you go. So we went there, and we basically were just picking stuff up. Some of the places we had beer, some of it were just like I don't know, give me a six pack, and just to get stuff and just just to bring back. And I can't remember if we stayed overnight. No, we stayed. I can't borrow this forever ago, but yeah, I just always have like, I just remember it being such a cool experience and like enjoying, um, what was I talking about that? Yeah. Cause they were saying to go everywhere. So like that was just a local example, but I feel like that's happened every single place I've ever been. So the, and it's like when there's more than one brewery in proximity to each other, it all of a sudden it makes that area more attractive for beer nerds. Cause I'm like, well, if there's one brewery that's like wild far, like say Badlands, it's a destination brewery, but they're that world renowned that it's like you're gonna do it. But if you wanted to, you can go twenty minutes up the road to Sun and Hill, which who make incredible lagers. So it's like 
when they're all piled together, it actually creates a stronger scene that it becomes like a tourist attraction. It's a, it's a, it's unlike any other industry. It's super strange and um, very fucking cool. Yeah. You know? Um. Fuck yeah, Dave. Your history. Yes, How'd sir. you get into beer? What's the vibes? So, uh, I, I don't remember what, what year it was exactly, but I, I think I started off, it was usually always going to Buffalo Wild Wings. I don't know if you guys have them up in Canada we or not. We fucking do. We used to go to Vermont for it. <laughs> Bro. And we moved to Hamilton two months ago, and we were driving on our recall. We got the keys, but when we had the keys to the house, we were moving like three weeks later. And we were driving up to go somewhere to check out furniture, and then we saw a Buffalo Wild Wings and lost our fucking minds. Because we <laughs> used to go to Vermont, and on the way back, we go to B Dubs and get like 40, 50 wings and bring them back and eat them for like three days. And now it's down. You know, I'm, it's I'm most surprised. I'm most surprised that you guys actually, you guys, you guys call it B Dubs up there as well. I was we, just gonna say that. I I heard Americans say it, so we call it that because you know. Yeah, all right. Well, yeah. It's- that makes sense. Uh, I, I try and be uh, authentic. So it, was, anyway. so it was always going to B-dubs, like right when I turned 21. Um, and uh, I'd always either drink Sam Adams, Boston Lager, or Cherry Wheat. And they used to drop the cherry in the bottom of the glass. Cool. And uh, that that was like my introduction to, to craft beer. So, uh, I mean, what did I turn 21? Around like 2006? 2006? I, yeah, think, I think that's what it was. So that's that's right around when I started actually like exploring more beard styles. I was really into Newcastle. Okay. Um, wow. And then uh, – so I was in really into Newcastle. And then I started getting into Boston Lager, Cherry Wheat, and that started getting me into um, Bell's Amber. Okay. So Bell's, Bell's Amber is where it really started to take off to where I started really exploring um, to where more local – local craft beer and then what happened was which led into good pour was right around 2010 i think 2000 yeah 2010 my in-laws got me the uh, beer subscription for six months so they got me a subscription to the beer club of america craft beer club of america and every month in the mail i would get uh 12 a 12 pack uh four different beers two beers uh, for two different beer breweries, okay. so, and I would get I would get th- three each of those, right? So like I started getting all these boxes, and I was just like, holy shit! Like there's so much beer, um, and the it's reason why they the even sent, yeah, even why they sent it to me, was because we were in Vancouver, and we were at a vegan restaurant, and the only thing that they had at that vegan restaurant was Canadian craft beer, and I don't remember what the first first beer that I had was. I was just like, I don't know, give me the amber. Because I was really heavily into Bell's Amber. So I was like, give me the Amber. And I fell in love with it. And I, I kept talking about it the entire time we were at dinner. So, ne- you know, Christmas came around. And next thing you know, I get this thing in the mail. that said, you know, you got a six-month six subscription to the Craft Beer Club of America. So that kind of set it up. That kind of set it off, man. And that was like early on in craft beer. So I like, I was taking a picture of every bottle. And then I started doing that. And then I created, because right around that time, is when Facebook started doing groups and uh, business pages, right? So then I created the the original Good Pour group. It was just a group where my whole thing was take a picture of your beer, tell us what you think of it. And it's like, <laughs> this is like 2010, right? So that group still only has like 90 people in it or some shit like that. But what it did was it spawned into Marissa telling me, man, you really like this stuff. You're really good at events because I worked in radio as well. Um, I worked in the, the events department. Um, so I knew how to throw on events. I knew how to coordinate things. And she was like, you should do this. Um, because I, what I started doing was getting really involved in, in the Facebook business pages. So I created a good poor Facebook business page after the group. And then I started going to all these bars and restaurants and breweries and be like, hey, the MLCC doesn't allow you to promote things online because you're within this, the three tiered system of what we have in Michigan. Right. Um, let, let me, I can be your middleman and I can promote these things for you because I know how to run a business page and I can promote it because I'm outside the three tiered system. So they were like, okay, we, we have no idea what you're talking about. 
but it sounds like you know what you're doing. So I, uh, I developed a really good partnership with one restaurant. It was a barbecue place called Lockhart's Barbecue in Royal Oak. And we did a ton of events with them. This was like early on uh, KBS ticketed events type shit. Like way early on where people were like lining up at specific places because they were dropping KBS. Yeah. Um, wait, wait, hold on, so hold on. Like, I got to ask a question. Hold on. Go you said Lockhart's yeah, then. Is that is that Drew Ciora? Because we're talking about, about Royal Oak Brewing Company and then you mentioned uh, Detroit Beer Company, right? That's, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, which I don't know if that's, not, sorry. I, I don't know if it's yeah, no, I don't know if it's the same ownership for all three of those anymore. I have I I heard it was not, but yes, back then it was for sure. Got it. Um, sorry. So that's no, that's good. And then I think what my the biggest event was that really set things off for me is I worked with uh, Right Brain Brewery, and Right Brain Brewery they always do a Mangalista pig porter, where they actually take you know the parts of a mangalista pig and they throw it in the beer um, to okay. give it like a smoky bac- bacon flavor, right? So so they, they did that and what we did was is that Lockhart's, uh, and I'm telling the story because like th- this is the biggest event that like really put me in the, in the, in the zone that I'm in right now. So um, we had a bunch of people come out. We had a band play. We had a lot of things going on that day and it was the big release for uh, right Brain Brewery's Mangalista Pig Porter, where we did an 80 pound stuffed pig that uh, Bubba Coddington, Steve Bud- Bubba Coddington, he's a pit master. He is, owns his own business now. Um, he's the one that was like, Yeah, let's do this. And that was my first paid event that I did. Hmm. Before that, I was doing everything pro bono just to see how I could start my own business. And that's what I did. Like I, it was an actual LL, LLC registered with the state of Michigan, my first business. And that was my first payday was, was with Lockhart's barbecue in uh, what we called the pig and pint with the Mangalese to pig Porter. So that event right there was what set it off for me. And then from there, I, remember that, I just kept, I, I remember yeah, you I talking about it. that. Yeah. That was a big thing. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So I, I stuck with it. And then, you know, along the way, like you just mentioned, I, I met uh, people like you, uh, which I thought it was cool as hell, man, because I was like, man, you can really develop some some friendships and relationships with people internationally through beer like this. And it was the it was the wildest shit. And like you said, man, we've we've known each other for like ten years, just, just and just that's what like Instagram and Facebook that, and yeah, beer. that was it. That was it. And uh, so I, I stuck with it. And uh, you know, I think it was three years in the MLCC changed the rules. Now breweries and restaurants can can prom, promote online. So like my my third party middleman stuff was pretty much done. Mm, okay. But that set the tone and stuck me in this spot where I was like I fell in love with the business side of brewing. Um, I realized I was a really shit brewer, but I could promote the hell out of it and I could sell the hell out of it. So um, I, I kind of stuck with that um, uh, through through everything. And then you know uh, starting uh, high five pedal tours. Which uh, was, if you ever seen them, giant pedal pub, uh, bar bikes. Uh, actually, I can't say pedal. I did say pedal pub. That's trademarked. I can say pedal bar bike. Um, there we go. So, <laughs> uh, uh, but the, with, with that, it was like you know we were. I did that in Ann Arbor, and you talked about all the breweries that you saw in Ann Arbor, and uh, you know where there are three. three Jolly Pumpkin, we went to too. Directly That's in downtown. Is. Yes. Yeah, Jolly yeah. Pumpkin, Ann Arbor, and so, there's one more. Now there's homes, but yes. Like. So there was, uh, so the downtown Arbor Brewing Company is no longer there. Okay. Um, they still do have two locations, but it was Arbor Brewing Company, Grizzly Peak, Blue Tractor, and Jolly Pumpkin. So there were four four breweries right in downtown Ann Arbor. Uh, but what they also had were uh, things like they had a Hopcat down there, which is a, a very specific craft beer bar, Ashley's specific craft beer bar, um, and then they also had. Um, I forget what it's called. It's con- it's connected to Grizzly Peak. It's in the basement. It's a German beer bar. Okay. Oh, that bar called. is so cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Oh, what I is forget, that? I forget called? the name. Of it, so, yeah. We so, can- like, we I was able to to set up sp- different tours uh, based off of the breweries and the in the different beer spots. So, uh, there there it's two businesses that were really focused on craft beer, just because I loved craft beer. And through there was all a of this, place called The Cellar by Grizzly Peak. The Cellar, 
Like Grizzly Peak or Heidelberg Restaurant and Bar? No, Heidelberg is, is down the street. It, the cellar... He's not they the may one. have changed the name. That, that, if it's connected to Grizzly Peak, that's it. That's probably the one. So maybe they changed because because it, 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 it is in a basement. So, gotcha. Um, but that makes both, sense. Apologies. I mean, that Continue. Was, you know, no, that's all right. Um, through most of everything, except for my first year of High Five, I had some sort of job. So everything was always a side hustle. And then finally, High Five Pedal Tours came along. And I quit my job to only do High Five Pedal Tours. And I did it all by myself, right? So... Um, my love for craft beer really shined through that. And then my second year of doing high five pedal tours, I was like, well, yeah, I love doing this, but uh, I'm not paying the bills. So I need to do something else on top of this. And that's when I became uh, the marketing and events manager at Arbor Brewing Company. Okay. So I remember that. Now that now is my specific, specifically my first job at an actual brewery. And okay. I was there for a couple of years. I uh, got fired from there. And then in between – through Detroit and Arbor Brewing Company, I uh, did some uh, consulting work and worked with an uh, old-time friend that we just mentioned a little bit earlier, Batch Brewing Company, because at the time, Stephen really needed me. Uh, they just got, uh, they just basically got taken and out $95,000 from uh, a, a supplier, an equipment supplier um, that went bankrupt. They paid him in full, $95,000, went bankrupt, money gone. Right. So he's like, I have to try to recoup this. I have an idea. Um, I need your help on, on trying to market this thing. So we had, we landed on a beer subscription uh, where people would pay uh, $120, uh, $120, $120, <laughs> $120 um, up front. And each month they would get a four pack of uh, a small batch beer that batch did. And initially... His goal was let's sell 300 of these before uh, by Christmas, and so we started this in September. Yeah, we started in September, and he was like, "Let's do this and and sell 300 by Christmas." And we actually ended up uh, in a month and a half instead of selling 300, we sold 500 in a month and a half. Jeez. So so we recouped a bunch of money right up front from him. We didn't get all 95,000. But it definitely recouped a bunch of money that they had they had lost from that. So, from there, um, I was introduced to Mike and Megan Turuff uh, of uh, our distributor at Brew Detroit uh, M4 CIC, and uh, you know somebody, uh, my buddy Marty actually connected me with those guys, um, who also fucking works at Marty. M4 now. Uh, fucking Marty, um, and he he connected me with them, and I actually interviewed with Mike and Megan for a sales position that they had. Um, and they were like, actually, we love it. We love you, but we think that our friends at Brew Detroit may benefit a little bit more because they're in need of exactly what your skill set is. Mm -hmm. And they introduced me to my old boss, Ryan Locke. And Ryan, from there, uh, we, we met once, and he was like, yeah, you're in. Maybe. So from there, I was the Brew Detroit uh, sales rep and then also handled all the marketing for it. Um, and at the time, uh, he was like, we have a big goal. You have to do, you have to basically double what we did in sales last year. And we, we ended up doing 136% of what we did the previous year. And then it just was onward and upward from there, uh, to where we're even through the pandemic, uh, we were, we were above where we should have been. So that's yeah. my craft beer journey it leads me into where I'm at right now as the director of sales and marketing at Brew Detroit. Amazing. Dude, that's awesome. That's uh, I feel like I knew most of that, but in like patches, it's cool to hear both of your stories like in a, a linear fashion. I love it. Um, yeah. What I want to do is get into the – I want to get that story out first. Let's get into the next beer, and then yeah. uh, I want to get into a bit more about Brew Detroit, about how that business came about, and about uh, you know exactly what you do because it's a pretty unique setup. Yeah. So oh, we got Pleasant IPA. Yes, I really. I'm looking. So, I'm looking forward to this one. I really enjoyed it. It's an American IPA, which is yeah, much less common than you would think these days. At least out these these parts. I'm not sure about out there. But. And for the yeah, uninitiated, so we'll, this is yeah, our this is our state flag, by the way. Ah, gangster. He's yeah. got a better view of it. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, our our, des our designer uh, Ian Burke. Uh, Ian Burke is. Oh. Uh, 
fabulous. Uh, an il- illustrator, graphic designer. He's amazing. Um, I basically, I'll come up with an idea of something that I think we should have for a label. And honestly, I, I tell him, here's what I think. I don't want to give him too many details unless I really want something. And he usually nails it. But I, I don't think there are many labels where we did a second round of revisions. And this is definitely one where we didn't touch it uh, after he did it. And uh, Love it. so, yeah, this is this is uh, an American IPA dry hopped with uh, all Michigan grown hops. Uh, so we have Michigan Chinook and Michigan cashmere hops. Don't sleep on Michigan hops. Never. No, man. Sleep. Well, here's here's the here's the craziest thing. Like uh, back in um, like I want to say three. No, probably more like five years ago. Uh, the craziest shit I was watching, um, I was watching a, a show on Discovery Channel. I don't remember which one it was, but they started talking about how Michigan hops started making it their way over to Europe. And people started using Michigan hops in Europe because a lot of these hops are grown really close to the, what is it, 42nd parallel? Mm-hmm. 40, 45th? 42nd. 45th parallels. 45th is 45th. the one that we have. For, that's what it is, 45th. Right. It's great parallel. So, Love that I mean, parallel. It, Halfway like in between the, the, the equator and the North Pole. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Uh, for, so 45th parallel, right? So the, the weather and the climate is, I mean, that's where they, they, a lot of, you know, a lot of grapes are grown for wine as well because the climate is like supposed to be right on the money for, for growing stuff like that. And uh, so we have a, a few uh, hop producers and farmers up in uh, northern Michigan, close to the 45th parallel. Uh, Michigan Hop Alliance is one of them. That the Chinook that's in here is from Michigan Hop Alliance. Love it. Represent local shit, boys. Cheers. Gardenia. Yes. This is great. It's like it's so interesting because it's not quite like a full-on West Coast, but it's exactly what and you think of an American IPA. That's what this is? It's it's a third yeah, that's, coast and that's, IPA. <laughs> It's Third a what? Coast IPA. Third right. coast. Third, the Michigan, because of the the Lake Michigan, the amount of uh, the amount of shoreline we have, it's equivalent to what they have in places like California or others, because the lake is massive. So the third coast is the love shoreline it. of Lake Michigan. I love it, and it's like it's just it's just us trying to make a big deal out of ourselves, like we always do. Hey, I've heard it in rappers say that like uh, there's like a a name for it. Like I think they do call it like East West and like. There's a name for, I think third coast is maybe what they actually did call it, so it might just be like a thing. But this is like, it's a 7% IPA, like you said, with Michigan hops, and it's citrusy, it's piney, it's bitter and grassy, it's uh, it's nice and balanced, it definitely doesn't taste 7%, but it's like not extreme West Coast as far as like that sort of tongue-ripping type of situation. So it's like, it's what, it's like, I feel like it's a style that doesn't get made enough these days. Is this like, what do you guys think of American IPAs? I mean, do you see them much in Michigan? Is this are, like you, a, are you seeing his theme here? The third beer you've said that about. Mm. <laughs> Fuck your ass. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Brew Detroit are just going. So there, like, yeah, there's, we're very strategic on a lot of things. So this beer we released last year. And the reason why there are a few different reasons why we went with the label that we did, and it's kind of subliminal. One, people in Michigan love Michigan. <laughs> well, oh, I mean, I Zach, know Zach was just talking about. Zach was just talking about. Two, you see the the buck and the moose that are on there. We yes. released this last year, right around when hunting season started in Michigan. Okay, big so, deal. So You're instead a big of so in, okay, yeah, okay. so instead of doing. A camo can or a bright orange can. Um, I was like, if we put these on here, it's going to people are going to see it, and because of the time of year, they're going to associate it with with hunting and the state of Michigan at the same time. So strategically, I always have tried to <laughs> try to make a couple moves ahead of what people are thinking, uh, just because I I know that people are are really going to uh, see things like this and be like, oh shit, that makes uh, a lot of sense for me to get that beer um aside from getting your your camo bush light 30 packs you know what i mean so um well, i mean a plus yeah, around for, here for, you get too close to camo and orange they'll end up looking like two-hearted you don't want to mess with that 
Yeah, and there's there's plenty there's plenty of beers that that you know people want to mimic that. And again, somebody's going this way, we're going to go the other way, right? So, what how 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 can we portray the same thing uh, in a in a much in a much different way, but also in a in a very eye catching way? So what you'll see with most of these labels is uh, with Delray, Yumtown, and then the, the fourth one we'll get into here in a second is most of our labels are, are white with an illustration or some kind of design on it. This one, slightly different because when you put it in the lineup with all the rest of the Broody Detroit beers, if we want that one to stand out a little bit more, because in most stores, our beer is going to be with each other, that they're going to see all of our white cans, and then they're also going to see one that's not white. Right. right. So if we're, we're doing these hundred barrel batches that we want people to pick up, yeah, we want them to pick up the other beer as well. But if we're doing these hundred barrel batches, especially IPAs, we want those things to move a little bit faster than what the rest of the stuff is. So strategically, there's a lot of layers on why I, sp- I choose things like this and, and specifically do things like this. It's, it's not just I, I think it's a, a cool looking label. There's a lot of thought behind why we're going this route. I love it. It's uh, it's. I love to hear that. I didn't know any of that. I didn't expect that. That is super dope. And on top of that, the liquid is interesting. It's it's different. It's sort of unexpected. Well, when I say different, it, this used to be, if you think about IPA, sort of that West Coast American IPA. This is what you would get most of the time. And uh, I feel like there's a you know kind of like with Krispies. I don't know if we talked about this when we did the Blue Detroit pod or just shooting the ship. But I feel like the there's like a pendulum swing a little bit. Obviously, haze isn't going anywhere, but I feel like there's a, a renewed interest in beers like this because everything is juicy and hazy and tropical or whatever. And now we're coming back to this. This is like a softer version where it's sort of like still approachable for the people who don't like hoppy beers. But like, yo, if you have this, you know, it's just a little bit yeah. of citrus. It's nothing to be there's scared a, of. You know? There's a buzz phrase that gets thrown around true to style. And that's that's what this one is, right? Like, you don't need the the other, uh, as they say in France, accoutrement. You don't need anything more to it. It is what it is, and it tastes good because of it. Yes, exactly. Just straight up IPA. No, I like this one. This is this is cool. This is a nice little switch up because we did a couple crispies, and now we've got a couple of IPAs to sort of round it out. So uh, now this is great, boys. I really like it. And this is something that uh, nice. I don't, I find I pre- if it's a style I haven't had for a while. You just have this new appreciation for it, I guess, right? Like it's, and it makes it, it's just like a more interesting thing. It's like cool, like you drink a lot of haze. I drink a reasonable amount of haze, so you do. It's like it's always great, but then this would stand out a little bit more in that lineup of just things that you drink because you're like, oh fuck, these flavors, man. I, if you haven't drunk it for a while, there's a lot of people out there. That's kind of more why I'm saying it. Like I try and diversify at least a reasonable amount, but there's a lot of people who kind of just go haze and smoothies or pastries and, and they kind of stick to that and they don't really expand like all of us have been into beer a long time so we have tried the rainbow we've tried everything so coming back to something like this in this day and age i think is more welcome than it even used to be because it sort of reminds people that hey you know this type of shit still exists and i feel like i imagine in michigan because you got too hard and stuff like that it's still pretty popping but out here west coast ipas a very, I would say, rel- pretty, yeah, relatively uncommon. They're not something you find regularly, and to find a good one isn't isn't the easiest. So you know, personally, I get a hold of one. It's always a, it's always a treat, which is weird, but I guess it shouldn't be that rare, right? Yeah, there was a there was a shift not too long ago, actually, right around when we get into to this last beer. Um, it's actually the reason reason why the name is what it is, and <laughs> why why the, why the label is what it is. Um, there that two years ago, I think there started to be a shift, um, in what people were looking for, at least here, mm-hmm. um, in their IPAs. It was kind of like, um, I don't know. It was like the uh, like. <laughs> I guess reverting back to the early stages of beer evolution as far as Michigan goes. And it was quick, right? So we're, see- we're seeing this cycle is starting to be uh, a very short cycle, at least, you know, for me getting into uh, when I got into craft beer, you know, in Michigan, there was like 112 breweries in Michigan. Um, 
which, you know, that was a little over 10 years ago. And at that time, you know, it was big stouts. It was uh, IPAs. Um, and then it started getting into the New England's. And then now I'm seeing a lot of people are reverting back to uh, the BBA stouts and the lagers and early on so that they can, you know, kind of cleanse their palate. And then different things keep coming out here and there, right? So uh, f for me, uh, that shift two years ago uh, is what led us into, and I don't want to get into it just yet, but this fourth beer, well, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about here in a second. Um, but, uh, this, this IPA here was after this fourth one, but at the same time, since that shift was happening, we stopped doing these small batches of New England style IPAs and let basically cloud 19 do its thing for us. And then all of the other small batch IPAs that we're doing, uh, and all of the, um, I want to say like larger batches. So pleasant IPA is a hundred barrel batch. Uh, a lot of those are, you know, uh, West Coast style, style IPAs, American IPAs, double IPAs, but they are definitely not hazy. Um, we only had two no. really hazy beers that were brewed uh, in large batches. Wham, 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 wham. It, Talk about mopeds. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's nothing cool about mopeds was probably the last that we did was small batches, New England style IPAs. And that one was, that one was a fun one because what we did there was the, the co coming up with a name. Like I hate spending a shit ton of time on names. And so what I wanted to do is because we were having a conversation with one of our bar bartenders, Mike V um, yeah. was he, he was, he was in a moped club in a scooter <laughs> club. And I was like, I want to name this something that has to do with mopeds. And I was like, Mike, what, Tell me something cool about mopeds. And he was like, there's nothing cool about mopeds. And I said, <laughs> that's, that's the, the name. fucking name. <laughs> so we, we did we did this uh, label. I told him to send me a picture of him on his fucking scooter. And he sent me one. And it, so it's like him uh, with like this green hue to it, black and green only, with him sitting on his fucking moped with the city of Detroit behind him. And it, it's it. called There's Nothing Cool About Mopeds. And the way we put the name on the beer was in quotes. So the name of the beer was There's Nothing Cool About Mopeds, but it was in quotes and it said, uh, you know, dash Mike V Moped Enthusiast. Yeah, show that shit. Yeah. And <laughs> the one of my favorite things about it, too, and you guys have done this with what I'm wearing now, uh, is there was a shirt with it. It says, all it says on it is Mopeds Suck. One of my favorite <laughs> shirts. Yeah, <we> <laughs> And we did that. Uh, we actually the time. part. There's a uh, Detroit Moped Works, which is where actually Mike V used to work there. He used to work on mopeds there. Uh, like, Detroit seriously. Moped Works. Uh, we, okay. we partnered with them and did this like '80s style uh, promo video, where like oh. we had like the 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 VCR noise and everything, the blue screen nice. that said play on it, and then we had like the you know the fucking uh, like lines in the video and shit and like old school like synth type music like it was straight up 80s uh because that's what their brand looked like so that that's always been one of my things too uh, is is i want to bring other businesses a, a, along with us and do some cool shit just so just to highlight those those other businesses and that came yeah. in, in the pandemic right there because as well. that that is one of the things that brew detroit does i think better than anybody else and it is off, I'll make up a term right now, off beer collaboration. Hmm. Nobody else does it. And if they do, they don't come close. I mean, the, the pineapple head high with the, with the clothing company, uh, working with uh, my Wayne County Life friends. Uh, they're, like, they're like internet comedians. Dave does such a good job because people that drink beer do other things too. Right. Right. Like, we, we're, I'm not singularly focused. So I, I love the idea. Look, and I love when my friends collab, right? When when Brew Detroit collabs with with Loaded Dice or whatever, like awesome. But I love collabing with non brewers, and I think Brew Detroit does it better than anybody else. And in fact, I'm not sure anybody else is even doing it. Anyway, that's, I said to put that out not, there. Not, not that I'm aware of, and it's it's always like when I do it, I'm like, these pe people need to know about X company. Like they, I, I feel like suicide machines. Yeah. 
Yeah, you have suicide machines, uh, like uh, there, you know, like shit like that. Yeah, man. Like again, I go back to what I was talking about when we were taking our trip. Is I just want to tell some cool stories to my grandkids about shit that I did, and then you know, as I'm telling them, be sipping a, a BBA stout. Uh, okay. and, and just telling, just telling them about the cool shit that I did, and they'd be like, "My grandpa is cool as fuck," and that's what I want. That's what I want. That's what Beautiful. I live for. <laughs> I love that. So shit, yeah, man. I mean, it's yeah, it's uh, you know, it's just um, yeah, I, I digress on on that, but it's it, it it's fun. It, it's a good fucking time. I love it. I love the approach. It, Go on, it matters. Yeah. It matters, and especially with what Dave said earlier. There's something about Detroit and something about Michigan that people, and I know that people from wherever you're from, for the most part, you know, you got that loyal to your soil vibe. There's something about Detroit. I think it's because everybody else, for the most part, especially if you're the age Dave and I are, uh, Detroit wasn't cool until three years ago. So for over 35 years, almost of my life, people have just shat all over it. Well, Mm. fuck that. You know, like, we don't want to hear that. And you can say it all you want. I'm not talking about you specifically, the the proverbial you. Um, (laughs) Fuck this guy over here. Oh, wait, no, wrong way. See, I still can't. Right. Uh, and, and, so, and so I love the, I think I hate to use the term synergy, but there's the, the connection that Detroit businesses have no matter what they produce. Detroit, may, we make things. Like, that's our thing, mm. right? Like, we make cars, but it's more than cars. We make beer. There's fabulous uh, spirit makers here. There all kinds of things. You know, uh, Shinola makes pretty watches. And so I, I think the, the maker... Uh, is a mark of Detroit. Hmm. I think, you know, if you make stuff, you make stuff together. Hmm. That's great, man. It's an interesting it's really point. Well said. Yeah, brilliantly said. I've always loved Detroit uh, because I'm a hip hop head. There's always been rappers. So I, I kind of don't hate anywhere. I just think everywhere is cool because it's always unique, particularly I'm in North America. I'm not from here. This shit is fascinating to me every day. The Detroit, when we went in 2012 with Scotty and I, I was amped as shit like to me detroit was exciting and there was parts of it i was like i'm gonna die right now like this is fucking terrifying we went to you the might. big ass um yeah you might exactly the, you actually might uh, we went to the train station and michigan central yeah and it was all like overgrown and shit just because i want to see it oh you should um, see it now is it worse yeah. or better no oh, no so they put better. the ford motor company bought it and put like a bazillion dollars into it it's gorgeous Oh, see, I gotta get back. So, like, checking that out, and like, I just thought there was something. How do I say it? I like underdogs, and I feel like Detroit is always an underdog. I've always felt like one myself. I've always felt like there wasn't always people believing in what I, whatever the fuck it was that I was doing, and I see that in Detroit. And I think that everything that I, all my experiences that I, I've only, I guess I've only been there twice, but. I enjoyed it so much, and I appreciated the people, and I could tell that everyone was working their fucking ass off for everything they had. Everyone had to make shit happen in a city where all the infrastructure was taken away. It had it was one of the, arguably the greatest city in in the continent for a period of time, maybe in the '60s or something. There, when it was like this, my grandfather worked for um, Holden, which in Australia, which was owned by GM. So. He, which is Holden, is like the biggest kind of car company in Australia. I don't know who owns it now, but he used to travel to Detroit. He nearly got jacked in an alleyway in Detroit and stuff. And like he always spoke highly of it, so I always thought it was cool because of him. And then going there a couple times and just seeing it and meeting the people and just everyone is just there's no bullshit from what I experienced. Everyone was just sort of doing their thing like and like you said a maker city of makers i think that's just such a cool way to look at the city and now it's having a renaissance and it was a place that was like critically ignored to the point where like y'all just had to like build from nothing almost probably to the to it's probably a good thing in the end like you know what is it the roads come out of concrete type of thing so you had you had to come together and all the artistic communities throwing raves and abandoned buildings and shit. One of our friends used to always go there for that. Yeah. Apparently it was a vibe, you know, Detroit house, you know, Detroit hip hop. Yeah. techno. Yeah. Y'all, y'all do yeah, that buddy. shit. There's a bunch of amazing rappers, you know, Royce and them and like even big Sean and stuff, putting on them on a larger level and not to mention all the, you know, the other sort of artists that are coming out of there, Danny Brown and, and fucking cats like that. I think Dej Loaf is from Detroit too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it's like 
it's just I don't know. Isha. I've always had Isha exactly like an actual legend. Oh, I love Isha. Forever. I just feel like y'all have been doing shit on a on a level for so long, and it's just like criminally fronted on. So I think it's even cooler to see Detroit and like Detroit beer be consistently fire. Y'all, when I went there in 2017, y'all were staunchly like, nah, fuck that. We're not following trends. Fuck your haze. I'm like, oh, there's one haze, really sick. And they're doing their thing. Y'all just like had your own thing going and you've kind of been true to that. And yeah, cool. It sounds like since the time I've been there, people were moving into the, the trends a little bit, but still you're doing it your way. And that's what it really feels like. What you guys say. People won't accept people won't accept anything else. That's the thing. Like you talk about what, what brewers want to make if we're talking about beer or whatever. Um, you can it's it's the two for you, one for me thing. If you don't have the two for you, you're not gonna sell anything. And so right. I think that's one of the things that I mentioned earlier about authentically Detroit. You know, we can and just anybody else can too. We can smell the things that are not right. And we're not going to waste our time. And we don't have to. And that's one of the joys of being here. Dave mentioned there used to be 100 and some breweries. We've quadrupled that. So I, I could fall yep. down and I'll land on two breweries. <laughs> I love that shit, man. It's just, it's, it's just a, it's a beautiful story to hear it. I still feel like we haven't gone into, and this is my bad, I still haven't asked, what's the history of Brew Detroit to actually get to into the, the crux of, I know because we've just been yapping, mm. it's, it's, a, it's a vibe, but just so people know, like, what's Brew Detroit about? What's the story? How did it come about? You know, the contract routes and then leading into the, the individual products. So the process started right around 2013. At least getting the building up, up to code and everything like that. And then it wasn't until 2014 when Brew Detroit started all of its contract brewing stuff. So uh, there were a number of contracts that have come and gone uh, from there. But... F- the roots of Brew Detroit is contract brewing okay. um, to where, you know, we started off really early on. The first thing we had was the 100-barrel Browcon system. So we always had a 100-barrel system. Um, and we also always had the two-barrel system, but not to the size uh, or capacity of what the, the nano system is. So 2014, uh, we grabbed some, uh, some brands that uh, – did well. Some brands that did not do so well. We did some uh, some rock star um, brands that uh, did okay, and then <laughs> some da- some damage was done uh, to that brand. I'm speaking of badass uh, lager. Um, the damage Sorry, was done to wrong. that the, the the beer that the beer that was uh, uh, brewed before it got in our hands. The it was why I'm saying the damage was done because, um, you know, it just got a really bad reputation. And then finally we took it over and, and turned it, it into gross. actually a, a decent logger uh, because that's what we're known for. And that's the system that we had. And, but there, there was no saving it after that. So, I mean, uh, we ultimately stopped doing badass logger. Uh, there were a number of other breweries that came to us uh, because they knew the, of the system that we had. Uh, the size uh, of our, our our production and packaging it's a that we factory. had. factory. It's wild. It's it's it is the largest brewery on on the east side of the, the state of Michigan by by far. I mean, we get obviously we can't touch Founders and Bells because they have, I mean, they the, the size of of <laughs> the size of their breweries is about the size of the city I grew up in in Wayne, Michigan. So <laughs> those are billion dollar companies. I mean, yeah, they're yeah. they are gigantic facilities. Um, or even, um, you know, up in up in Bel Air uh, with shorts. shorts, like those, yeah. those those facilities are are, are pretty big. Um, but on this side of the state, we are definitely the the largest. Um, so up until about 2016 is when we opened the tap room at Brew okay. Detroit, and even then we were just basically running off of the nano system and trying to fill the tap room with what we were running off of the nano system. Uh, it wasn't until later in 2017 when we started kegging beer. Okay. Uh, of our own br- of our own brand, uh, and then it wasn't until June of 2018 is when we started canning Cerveza del Rey. So okay. June of 2018 is right is is when the middle of 2018 is when we were like full on. Yes, we're also a brand. Um, let's get shit popping. And 2000 January 2019 is when I came on board. Okay. So the my, I basically was in charge of uh, of the brand. Uh, it was put in my hands, man, because uh, because of 
what I had done in marketing and what I was able to do. Like I, I could, no, I wasn't in sales, but I can sell, I can definitely sell things. Like I was in sales for, I, I, I guess. Right. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I was hired in and like, it was supposed to be 75% sales, 25% marketing. And, um, I knew that those two things went hand in hand, especially when we're, we're, we're working, uh, side by side. So it, with being in charge of both the marketing and the sales, I said, what we're going to do is we're going to create this brand and drive this brand and make it probably one of the coolest ba- brands in the state of Michigan and try to drive the sales from there, um, based on what our brand is. So we created this, this brand voice and the, the look and feel of this brand that we have a really good time. Uh, we don't take ourselves too seriously. Uh, but we take the beer seriously and people just really clung on to that. And it grew from there from, you know, we were doing early on, we were doing like, uh, like, uh, God, how many barrels we were, we were doing like 1200 barrels or something like that, which now, I mean, we're, like I said earlier, we're doing 1400 barrels of just Cerveza Del Rey. So, I mean, we're not, we're, we're getting closer to 4,000 barrels in three and a half years. And yeah, we're, we're in a situation where we know that we have that two barrel system in the back and we can test out beer a little bit quicker than what most places can do. Um, so we can, we can go into the two barrel system and do things like cloud 19 and, and do two barrel batches and then four barrel batches and then eight barrel batches and go up to 10 and start doing 10 barrel batches monthly. And then in a few months we go and scale up to a hundred barrels to where we started doing, you know, when New England IPAs were really, really kicking off in, in Michigan, uh, we were doing 200 barrels at a time of new, of Club 19. Nice. So, uh, so we, we took it and we grew, you know, like I said, 136% the first year, uh, 56% the following year, took a, took a dip into like 42% and then grew again into like 56%, 55, 56%. During the during like the the two pandemic years, we were still growing, and that's that's, that's part that that's in part with getting into, uh, you know, the chain stores and stuff like that. So in three and a half years, we took a brand that was, uh, relatively known for doing badass lager, to people forgetting that that ever happened, and putting out a product a product like Cerveza Del Rey, and uh, Yumtown Cloud Nineteen, and then getting into you know funner things. Uh, more fun things like uh, check this out. Segue into Panda Bear. Good timing. Uh, <laughs> double West Coast style India Pale Ale. And I just before we go any further while we're doing this, I, uh, Dave is is dead on in everything he said. I just I have a different different view of things because I'm a consumer, and that's I've been fortunate enough to see how a lot of different people do things and. Uh, I mentioned earlier the the synergy or whatever you want to call it with with branding, but it, it goes more than just hey let's collaborate on a beer. I mean I think about uh, Detroit City Football Club, right? We have uh, we have a professional soccer club here, and they they've worked arm in arm uh, for the last several years, and the the soccer brand is super dedicated and fervent, and the 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 that translated now all of those DCFC supporters are now like rabid brew Detroit supporters. And right. it's because of it's because of that that partnership. Or you talk about the 140. You know, do we have a do, does Brew Detroit have a mug club? No. We have a secret society instead. Right? Those kinds of things are just a little different. The mug clubs are everywhere. You're gonna walk into a brewery here in Michigan and you're gonna see a fuckload of mugs on the wall. They're all right. gonna look different. They're all gonna have their own little branding on them. You don't see shit. You walk into Brew Detroit, and it's a secret. It's right. a really poorly kept secret on purpose, but it's different. And so I, I think that when Dave talks about why the brand pops, it's because the beer is good, but the fun behind it is, you know, you can taste it. Hmm. I like that. Um, that's This is fascinating. So then, like, maybe, should we talk about this before I ask the question? Maybe we should do that. This was the beer that yeah, uh, yeah. the boys were uh, referring to earlier, uh, earlier. Panda Bear, a double West Coast IPA, uh, 8.4. Give the people what they so, want. Yeah, so exactly that. Like It was the two years ago when we started to see a dip in New England style IPAs. 
originally, to be honest with you, I had this name Pander Bear um, and this concept for a completely different. And I, you may have you may have seen this. See, mm-hmm. it was uh, it was at the time when it was like I want to do a fruited uh, New England style IPA with lactose in it uh, <laughs> and call it and call it Pander Bear to just pander to what the fuck was happening in craft beer. And it was like two years before this happened. So four years ago is when I came up with this idea. And then finally, um, two years happened. I was like, Oh shit, people are starting to get back on, on the West coast tip. Um, I'm going to use that fucking name pander bear, uh, to pander to the people who are going back to the roots of, of West coast, uh, IPAs and the, um, (laughs) Uh, the make IPAs clear again crowd. You used to uh, always say that. And do you know what? You used to say that at the time back when I really like was uber passionate about Hayes. And I was like, fucking Dave, man. What's he doing? Relax. But like, <laughs> look, man, I respect it. This is uh, this is a bang, a very cool label with the hipster panda on front, by the way, with the old, uh, with the beanie and shit. Um, so... Yeah, so with with the label too, like I was like, I want to create a label to where this exact person on this can is walking through the aisles and sees an exact replica of themselves wearing a flannel and the fucking beanie because like, we all we all have them in Michigan. We have a beanie, we have a lumberjack flannel. It's gonna happen. Right? Michigan so, is fucking cold here, man. I'm freezing. It's the same place, Michigan and Canada, boys. It's hilarious to me. Um, yeah. By the way, so, I this, mean, this beer has Simcoe, Mosaic, Michigan, Chinook, and Cascade hops. It's very serious. Yeah, but the, the, the same here. Michigan Chinook that we have in uh, actually Pleasant IPA, same company, Michigan Hop Alliance. Ooh. Shout out to Brian Tennis. Uh, so, it's the same company that we have in here. Love, love to see it. So this particular beer, 8.4%. Uh, I don't know if you guys want to have any thoughts on it, but it's definitely a leveled up version of uh, the Pleasant IPA. It's a lot sweeter, as you would expect for a 8.4% uh, beer. Um, definitely more bitter. It's not like, but do you know what's interesting? It's still very drinkable. Like it's not as intense as you would read. Like if you're reading the description of it, you'd think, "Oh, this is gonna tear my tongue apart. It's gonna be fucking like." pine and resin and bitter and uh, but it's the sweetness uh, kills that though i think that's the i think that's the kicker it's like it's like you take sandpaper to the edges you know and it it gets this nice yeah i think this is delicious yeah it's super smooth um. so uh, i mean admittedly also um not to this beer isn't the freshest beer that we have and i don't i don't care admitting that uh because what we do have is something that a lot of breweries don't have. It also is the fuck, man. we have a flash a flash pasteurizer, and what flash pasteurizers do is they double the life expectancy of beer. So for this one, yeah, I mean, we're this was done in. I mean, this was done in February for an IPA, right? You, you can look at this. It, it's Seven it's a little seven. bit more right, exactly. So we're looking at uh, it's a little bit more malt forward now which is why we're getting a little bit more sweet sweetness to it but the craziest thing about this beer is that head retention is great i mean i mean i can oh, see yeah. both the, the the heads on both your guys beers head retention is still great the bitterness is still there and you still get the hop aroma it's just a little bit more malt forward right so i mean i can which, see that at the same time at the pit. same time it was already malt forward before you know before now anyway so, so it's when like- we look at what the shelf life of our beer is. I mean, Pander Bear is, is a prime example of what we're able to do and make sure that we still have really good beer after way after what people think it should be. Because, I mean, it was done in February, right? And most people are thinking that, you know, if it's three months out, then it's and it's an IPA. It's, you know, forget about it. For a West so, Coast, I mean, yeah. Yeah, right, for a West what? Coast. But, I mean, you can, you can taste this and you still get the bitterness and the hops on it. And it's... It's wild. But again, when we talk about the advantages that Brew Detroit has, and again, the marketing, the thought process, it all matters. But the facility, too. Nobody else has any of the things that Dave is talking about, Mm. unless you are Founders or Bells or Shorts, too, to their credit. But I mean, the ability to, as Dave said, scale up from a two-barrel to a hundred-barrel, who else can do that? 
Who else has that ability? You have to use it smartly. I'm not. It's not a knock, but again, the flexibility that Brew Detroit has. When you talk about the ability to can that and keep this IPA good for seven months. I mean, again, Brew Detroit has this that we talk about adjuncts. There's is the commercial facility. Nobody else has that. It's not a thing. It's a great point, man. Like. I would not have known that this, I didn't even look at the, I'm pretty like uh, pedantic about IPA freshness. It's just something that I prefer a fresher uh, beer. I didn't look at this and I would not have known unless you told me right now that this, I just thought it was intentionally sweet. I don't, it doesn't feel muted, which is typically what happens. Like, yeah, the sweetness always comes through cool, but sometimes the sweetness comes through in we, along with like all the hop vibes are just completely muted. So I imagine then that this wasn't like a, excuse me, like a tongue stripping bitter fucking thing in, to begin with, right? No. No. Okay. I mean, it's it, it would be more tongue stretching if you drank it in March, but For sure. otherwise, no. I mean, it's and again, pleasant. I, I, I almost think, I, look, I, I, I'm not saying we should sit on IPAs and age them, but I, I I don't hate what happened across the last seven months to the taste of this beer. I'm with you, bro. I'm with you indeed. Haze is a different story. I feel like most Haze, even Troy Badlands was like, after four weeks, he's like, eh. I had, funnily enough, what day is it? Tuesday. Maybe on Saturday, I had, um, what, remember we all tasted the Superflux collab in the brewery? Yes. Yep. So that beer, I had it fresh because I went not the week after we went, but the one after that. So the week after we were there was our anniversary. I went the week after that and picked up all the anniversary beers. Had the the Superflux one. It was definitely uh, one of the best beers I've had this year. I had it last on Saturday night and it, it was not the same beer already after four weeks, which is very standard for Haze. West Coast te- definitely tend to have a, a lot longer last spent which i really appreciate about them in a world where haze dies so quick you've got an ipa that still is self you know a little precious it's not the end of the world though if this is seven months later and i wouldn't have really noticed that's a very very good sign of the quality of the production of the packaging almost specifically of the packaging really in it because it's the packaging that is what makes the beer last and then the the interesting thing too is what we do, um, and I, I'm sure a lot of breweries do the same thing. Is we do uh, we do tasting panels every Wednesday, and then we go back into our library. What the fuck? Uh, we take, you know, a couple, those? A couple. <laughs> a piece couple, of shit, Dave. Uh, a couple cases that we keep in the library, and in the library, what we do is we try to find out when there's a library. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, we try to find out when these, uh, each brand, I say brand, is that different beers, when each beer and brand uh, starts to sort of change flavors, and we make note of that. So we talk about hazy IPAs. We go back in the library, and we look at Cloud 19. And since we've been doing it for, you know, the last three and a half years, we go back and we look at each batch, and we say, when does this change from, you know, the the fruity uh hoppy flavor uh that we like in a new england style ipa and for cloud 19 right around five months and when is when you get the change from that hoppy stuff uh the hoppy aroma fruity flavors to malt, more malt forward so five cloud months, 19 eh? we, so and we again, know we know with cloud 19 the, when we get on long, of a library. five months yeah yeah so when well, we get again, it, on, it, it's a flex yeah so when we get when we go into the lab and we have that's what we have a lab, and the lab is the one that puts on uh, all of the the library uh, panels with all of our brewers, and they mark down on their sheets when things are changing. So we know for sure five months is when Cloud Nineteen starts to switch. So what we did was when I was the one who took over into this position, the first thing that I did is I was like, we're starting to go long on two hundred barrel batches of Cloud Nineteen. You know, we do those every, you know, four months or so. Let's switch it and let's go 100 barrel batches every three months. So now whatever goes on the shelves is super fresh. So we don't really get to those five months marks, five month marks very often. We still will um, on things that are on the shelves to where we're turning things over 
one in the big box stores in the the chain stores and chain grocery stores we want the freshest as possible in those stores so every three months every three months instead of every you know four or five months we're doing uh hunter barrel batches of cloud 19 so everything's fresh on the shelves Mm, okay I like that. So it's so it's it's all the research that we do in the labs. That way we have all of this data, and we can be like, maybe we shouldn't be waiting five months because it's turning multi. Let's do less, more often instead of doing more less often. I love that. I think that's really smart, particularly with that style. But it's great that you've had the uh, uh, initiative as a team to sort of look into that and the ability via the library that Zach rudely wasn't invited to, but whatever. Um, to you know. I know, Zach. It's okay. I'm looking out for you, bro. Dave, hook it up. Thanks, um, brother. So yeah, Somebody is. Always got you, bro. So, <laughs> when Brew Detroit was started and sort of as, as a... Was it intended to be uh, a brewery as it is now, as far as its own brand? Or was... Where did that, like... Or was it meant to be, like, a contracting facility? Like, where... It was just, it was just supposed to be straight-up contracting. Okay. It was, and, it, it was my, my, my boss who actually was like, we should do our own brand. And convinced our, our CEO that we should be doing so. Gotcha. And then that's when they decided to start introducing that. And then yep. they're back in business. Okay. The contracting businesses, I think, what, and, and I don't know if what, the, the three of us ever spoke about that when we hung out. But in Canada, particularly in Ontario, there's a bit of a stigma against breweries who contract, which I think is obscene and, and just It's ridiculous. a secret here. Okay. So, talk, no, here, talk about here's it. the here's the crazy thing. That's the same thing that what uh, what was like early on in the U.S. That's the same thing. Like people, that's exactly what people thought. Like, oh, you you brew, your beer is brewed by a contract brewing facility. You're less less, less of a brewery. Huh. Like that was that was the, it was the same thing here as well. But then Which you is, started getting like places like Rock Brothers down in Tampa, um, and us up in Michigan. Um, there are a few others in the Midwest as well, uh, that are pretty good sized to where they're like, Oh shit. Like there's really good beer coming in. Like untitled art, untitled art is done out of a contract brewing facility yeah, and they yeah. have, Oh, they're fabulous. They have some of the best beer, um, that, that you'll find in, in the U S and, and uh, I, mean, I don't know if they're in Canada, Canada. Uh, or not, no. you, I've had them before, but I know that they're definitely not here, but I've had them yeah. in the States. I mean, I'll give you a good example. When I met Dave for the first time, he took me to the facility and he could see the disappointment on my face when I saw the brands that were coming out of, oh, what are we walking out? He's, is he doing the thing? I'm just kidding. Uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> but I'm, the, again, I'm, I'm kidding. My phone died. No, the, the, but the, 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 the brands that Brew Detroit brews in fact, we've talked about a couple of them, but you wouldn't know. And so to me, that doesn't have to be a secret, but what I need to know is that the quality is not compromised. I need to know that the brewing standard in the commercial facility is the same as it would be at one of the city's oldest breweries. Because if it's not, it's beer's not a label. It's a liquid. We have to taste it. And if it's not... I mean, we were talking about this with, uh, in fact, with you and Tiffany, with different versions of Hetty. We were talking about Hetty Topper, right? Yeah. Like, there, there are, are there bad Hetty Toppers? Yeah, there are, right? And is it a common thing? No. But again, you have to pay attention to the way things are brewed. And so that's one of the things I like about Brew Detroit. They are, and their brewers, their commercial brewers are craft brewers. It's, it, it's, it's macro sized but craft focused. And again, I, I don't know. I mean, are they paying me to say this? Yes. Is it true? <laughs> also, yes. Also, yeah. but it's, it's true though, but it's still true. I mean, and if anybody wants to, you know, there, there's no challenge. It's, I don't know. I, I, I love the concept and the way they're able to blend the two. Mm, I like that a lot that you're saying it's like the professional quality as far as like it was at, as if it was in their own facility. The thing that I think people misunderstand, and I'd be curious to see what you guys think on this, I'm, I've, I've had my own business for a long time. I'm very passionate about entrepreneurialism and people doing their thing. If you think about craft beer, if you were going to start a brand new brand, you're going to drop 
one to two million dollars on a facility, Easy. on equipment. You could have a situation like Stephen at Bass where you get screwed, which has happened to breweries here that I know personally who got fucked. One brewery I know got fucked eight hundred grand. On uh, there was a, a company that went down in uh, Vancouver, and they 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 fucked half the country. It was crazy. Um, you know, if you're gonna start a brand. Why wouldn't you want to do market testing to get people used to the brand, to get some distribution, to do some tasting, to attend some festivals, to do some collaborations, and get that brand known and start getting some brand equity, start generating some revenue, and invest back into the business, then get your investing or bank financing, whatever it might be, to then open the facility, because you're opening a facility with one to two years or whatever of legwork which is giving you a head start in the game they're like oh i can think of like this brewery called overhop they're they from the people who own it are from brazil they immigrated to toronto they moved to quebec they were uh, uh contracting out of both provinces so they had two because the way that i guess it's like the same as the states like you know every province you have to have your own facility there you can't really distribute between provinces federalism it's obscene it's left over from prohibition it's fucking ridiculous and um they finally got the financing they opened their own facility uh there's another brewery called avant-garde did the same thing um that i saw they were uh contracting out the same facility called oshlag in montreal and then they opened the same place they are graduates of the contracting process both of those breweries got shat on at some point in time for doing that that shit like I, I, it pisses me off almost to the point as if there it's my own brewery that they're dissing. Like, I just think it's so short-sighted for beer f- drinkers, fans, whatever you want to call it, to knock a brewery because are you putting up fucking two million barrels, bro? I don't think you are. So shut the fuck up and buy your $5 IPAs and let these fucking hustlers do their thing and let them build their brands. I just don't understand the... Uh, like, I, And I love... I don't understand the hate for it, but I love businesses like Brew Detroit who are... Uh, giving that world-class facility to make the beer exactly how the contracting brands want it to be, envision it to be. They're um, allowing them to sort of help them fulfill their vision. If you think about how many, and I'd love to hear a take on Brew Detroit, like how many graduates of contracting to bricks and mortar um, that there have been, but Brew Detroit are contributing deeply to the craft beer scene of Michigan. Across by, the state. Across the question. And probably, oh, my uh, camera's, for, I'm just going to change the battery. I'll come back in a second. Um, so it's just like, it's just absurd that anyone would say anything negative. I'd love to hear what you guys think about that. I mean, look, before Dave jumps in, I mean, just really quickly, for something that doesn't work there, if Brew Detroit wasn't doing what Brew Detroit does, people like me would not be enjoying the beer that I do at the convenience that I do. Mm. I'd have to drive to X place in Michigan to X brewery to get beers out of their facility. I don't have to do that because Brew Detroit and their craft brewers are making these other beers where I am. And it's not about them being proximally or approximately close. It's about the distribution that they're able to make Five, ten times. Dave can tell you X amount of beers uh, that normally would the the scale it wouldn't be replicable. Dave, over to you. Yeah, there's. <laughs> is, is, are, I just switched my headphones. Are, they, are these cool? Are these, are these working? It's, it's working. They're, it's not, a... they're not cool, but they work. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think they're cool, Dave. I think you're always cool, Dave. Cool. They work. <laughs> cool. 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 Uh, so with, with the brands that we do, we, we are usually doing uh, alternating proprietorships or APs as we call them uh, to where we don't really do anything outside of breweries that already have brick and mortars. Okay. Um, and we, we do that for success rate specifically. So we're not starting too many brands, uh, but we're helping those brands who are already up and running. And Accentuate the positives. The, yeah, the, they don't like have that. the abilities to expand. We have one brewery uh, that we've been doing for a while um, that they have expanded three times. They're in uh, Williamston, Michigan, uh, which is close to Lansing, Michigan. Uh, and uh, they are a brewery that is very well known for hazy IPAs. 
there we may have talked about them. Saved, we may have saved, their, saved their brewery um, from you know demise uh, or folding completely, and uh, it, we're not the ones who've done it. There, they have a very talented owner brewer uh, in Travis Fritz. I'm speaking of Old Nation Brewing Company. Uh, that hail. brewing company, you can you can see on multiple um, uh, media outlets when they talk about New England style IPs that they are that M43 from Old Nation is always mentioned in mm-hmm. those conversations on the top in the U.S. So for Except us to be the who ones who it. who help who help them, uh, you know, get that beer out to the country uh, in the masses. Um, as well as other other brands that they have, um, it's huge uh, for us to say, look, these guys came to us for for a reason, and they continue to come to us for a reason. So it's Michigan not Michigan Haze Gods. Uh, yeah, it's not. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's not just that we have the capability of doing it; is that we have the capability to do it, and we do it extremely well. And uh, somebody like Travis Fritz would not come to Brew Detroit. Uh, and have us brew his beer, world class beer, uh, mm-hmm. from a world from a world class brewer, uh, and I, I can say world class because he's classically trained uh, internationally in Germany uh, on how to brew beer. So it's uh, you know he knows his shit, and he knows it's not it's uh, not about volume. We, we I mean y'all can no. handle the volume, but it's about the quality yeah. that can be replicated into volume. Yeah. And it's, you know, you go from the 100 barrel Browcon to the 15 400 barrel fermenters that we have to the gigantic canning line that we have, the lab, the storage facility. Um, there are a lot of things that we have that are very appealing to somebody uh, in a brewery who's growing at the speed and rate that Old Nation is doing um, to where, you know, we're, we're damn proud to be the, the brewery that old nation comes to to help them um you know continue to do what they're doing and and do it fast and do it well look it's 2022 it's time to build things to scale and you guys help people build things to scale it's again buzzwords everywhere but it's they're real things true yeah and we're we're just we're just in the in the situation where you know our own brand we have these tools at our disposal to where exactly what i said about cloud 19 we we took cloud 19 from super small batches in february of the year that i started february 2019 and started doing small batch releases and in the tap room only to where we were doing draft only releases to only a couple accounts in the city actually one account in the city of detroit to where it was just we couldn't keep up with it and finally um i went to my boss i was like look we need to take cloud 19 to the next level and do a hundred rail batch and release it there. And it turned into one of our flagships just because we had the ability to really scale up and start from two barrel batches to 10 barrel batches and so on up until a hundred barrels to where, mm. you know, we started doing 200 barrels and then because of how things shifted, we were able to pull back and start doing those hundred barrel batches every few months instead of 200 barrel batches every five months. That's nice. And see, that's what's great. That's what's great too is that they have the luxury of scaling up, but they use it properly, right? Power is power is what it is, but if you don't use it right, it doesn't matter. And so they think about the things they can do with what they have and use it properly. I think that matters. Yeah, no, it's a great fucking point, man. Um, that's super cool that you even, I, and I bet you're probably taking learnings from from brewing a beer like uh, M43. I imagine there'd be learnings even for the brewers. It sounds like you got a very talented team with uh, very, you know, like amazing equipment. But you know, I imagine that just by dealing with these other talented people, that there's sort of like a shared, yeah, information that's sort of helping make the Brew Detroit beers better, whilst you're also making the clients' beers better. Oh yeah, man. I, I mean, I, I'd be a fool if I didn't say that the reason why Cloud Nineteen is so good is because we didn't learn how to brew. New England style IPAs from the one of the best breweries for New England style IPAs in the country. I mean, that in would, the country, that would be yeah, in the country. That would be stupid and, uh, of me, and and I mean, that it, it's just the, the ability to be able to work with brewers and be able to have very young brewers at the time. I mean, Eric Selberg, 
at the time of brewing Cloud 19 himself uh, and learning what the process was of brewing M43, was able to, to brew Cloud 19 at the age of 26. And, and by the way, Eric a- Selberg is the brewer of all the things we've enjoyed this evening. Kid's a fucking yep. wizard. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, like I said, I mean, there's, there are a lot of, a lot of things that, uh, that I really enjoy about Brew Detroit. And one of them is the fact that I can always go to Eric and be like, Hey man, I have this crazy fucking idea about a beer. Let's make it happen. Like depth, depth was this wild idea that I had about, you know, let's, let's do a, a, a big stout, uh, imperial stout and put it in high end bourbon barrels. And we'll, what we'll do is we'll take the same recipe slightly adjusted every year uh but we'll do it with madagascar vanilla beans and we'll age it in uh different high-end barrels every single year and we'll Whoa. bottle it depth so three we coming out like next month yeah 332 bottles 32 bottles the second year and then our max amount of bottles that we'll do because we do it all by hand is 500 bottles so this year oh, will be the first year that we do five 500 bottles of with just I'm a single. Grab it while you're talking, about it. Keep, keep talking about it. I'll be back in like 30 seconds. Single. Grab it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, single. How long was your podcast, gun. guys? Well, everybody's batteries died, so it was all downhill from there. <laughs> it was. It was super long. So. Hey, look! It's the Brutus Detroit mean, podcast. I mean, yeah. Hey, Brutus Detroit podcast. Welcome everybody. Uh, our guest is. Uh, no. C say your name uh, first. From... <laughs> oh yeah. No, I don't. I don't do that though. I don't introduce myself on our podcast. Well, we've, we've been working on that. I mean, we've, we've, been, we've been trying <laughs> we did to do well. We, d- we did do okay with that for a while. I did okay with that for a while, I should say. Hey, we had, we had a golden run through Canada. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, but, I, was, I, was, and I, I was two for two, two for two for announcing myself in Canada. I'm saying. But I, when you talk about depth, <laughs> I think one yeah. of the things that I like about it is beer nerds like you and myself and C, we like verticals. I don't know why, but it's like a thing, right? Where we can be like, okay, we're talking about M43, right? The strawberry. I've got four in a row. We can, we can test them out, but every, every batch of depth is a vertical in itself. It's like inception vertical because of the way that it's made it's based on the one before that that's how verticals work so like you get like a double vertical if you have though i've not met anybody that's been able to hold on to the depth bottles every time i get one i drink it (laughs) you know i mean with with depth it was just this i'll I'll wait until c comes back because i don't think i've told him the story but with, with, with depth it was just this this idea that i wanted to we didn't have it right we didn't we had a uh, in draft form. We had a bourbon barrel aged stout, which was bourbon barrel aged cold brew. That was the only BBA stout that we had. I take that back. We had a Russian Imperial, which was called by Oh, Reverence. look at that! There it is. Yeah, look. There's depth that's two right there. there. It is good. That fucking beauty. And and it's not only it's that and that's a that's yeah. an original bottle. So that's gonna that's gonna be a little bit more mellow, uh, a little more vanilla y, yeah. but it's still gonna whoop your ass. Oh god, that's so good. I, I love that beer what so number, much. What, num- what number do you have on the side of that? 334 oh, yeah. of 432. Yeah, see? Hand yeah, labeled. So I, ha- I sat there and hand wrote all of the numbers. Yeah, your boy Dave, put, that, that's, that's his Hancock. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen. Listen, this, this, uh, this beer, Depth, is, was, was my like pet project or my baby to where... You muted yourself. Or... I muted myself. Oh no! There you go. Well, you were you were gone for a second. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so with with depth, it was um, I, I saw this this I don't know, it was something on the news about uh, Payless had done this project where they changed their name to. Uh, I saw Pulesi. that. Yeah, <laughs> that was genius. They changed their name to to Pulesi and they took all of their shoes and they marked them up super high. So like eighteen hundred dollars for like uh, yeah. forty dollars shoes and people Those clunky and, Gucci yeah. shoes and they come invited on. um influencers to come and then they all got excited and they spent their own money on the shoes. I remember this. Yeah, and was, people bought them right. So 
that was the that was the whole reason why I wanted to do depth. I was like, I want to do a bourbon barrel aged stout in high end bourbon barrels, and you know, go to a market price for a bourbon barrel aged stout and see what we can do in Detroit. Here comes depth, five hundred milliliter bottles, twenty five dollars a bottle, and we're 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 going at that high end crowd of something that is super rare. Age in high-end bourbon barrels for, you know, nine to ten months. Mm -hmm. And then sold in 500 milliliter bottles because at the time, 750s were dead. Nobody's drinking 750s or selling 750s. It's too much, bro. Uh, so I was like, let's go, down to, let's go down to the smaller format so more people can have it. Mm -hmm. And we created this fucking bottle that, I mean, people are yeah. waiting for it and signing up for the beer club because they get automatically get a bottle of this year's depth in, in, in the beer club. And uh, that's a huge driver aside from the jacket that they get. Um, to yeah. Jacket? Membership oh, no, wait, don't sell the jacket short. That thing's fucking dope. Yeah. Jacket. Oh, the jacket. Yeah. Oh no, dude. I mean, the jacket's fucking sick. I, I mean, I hold on a second. Yeah, costume change. Oh, day's going to come through and just flex on us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this so, is what we're talking oh, about. No. Listen, oh, I, I hung my jacket up and now I got moved. That's that's married life. Shit gets moved on. I respect it. I didn't know. But these it. are the things. <laughs> but these are the things I was referencing earlier when I was talking about the difference between a mug club and something else. Nothing wrong with a mug club, but at Brew Detroit, no. it's not a mug. We don't, I don't need a mug. I, I right here. So it's the now it's the show, jacket. It's the jacket. exclusivity. You get uh, you get your coin. You know. Uh, let's see. Challenge I got coin. both my coins here. The jacket is the got coolest shit. Coins. Got my hey. coins the coins lit. here. Right, so you got this year and last year's. Each member gets one of these coins. You get a jacket if you're a new member. And uh, you get a ton of perks, right? So uh, f for us, you know, we look at those different things, and it includes depth. And, um, you know, coming from this crazy wild idea, and they're like, yeah, go ahead, run with it. See what happens. To where it creates now we it's our biggest event of the year it's called the depth driver. day it's the release the release event uh of depth and everybody comes and picks up their bottles they pre-buy them and then we create i got so fucking bombed and... on last depth day oh, <laughs> oh. Shit. yeah you did <laughs> you, you uh you irish goodbye that event you have I to. did it was time to go <laughs> you know sometimes it's, it needs to be done i'm a big fan of irish goodbyes this is this is out. signal yeah uh, bro so this is the 2021 uh, bottle? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because it's called Depth 2, and I just checked untapped while we were talking there. So there's the original yep. one, then there's Depth 2, so this will probably tell you uh, what the deal is. But that's, yep. I'm really looking forward is to that, just... It's 14.1% blends. Too. Pardon? Yeah. What's the barrel on this one, Dave? Elijah on Craig. C has. Oh, yeah, that so, Blends is, Craig. so Blends is this year. Yeah, um, plans is year three, and then the first year was uh, Will It, Will It Sell Barrels. Right. Um, Tiff just came by to say hi, and she brought a little pop. Oh, oh, oh yeah, hey. little bag. You boys met Barrington. Hey, buddy, I love you. We did get to meet Barrington when we were on our Canadian journey. You were the uh, remember, remember Dave and Zach Barry? <laughs> say what up, man. He just uh, came through. He hasn't been on the pod yet. What's up, Tiff? So hey guys, Dave and Zach say hey. Hi. Hey, Tiff. She can't hear you. But hang on, yeah, let me unplug and see if she can. I've got pictures of Tiffany and Barrington <laughs> with us cute. doing the pod. How oh, cute! Okay. Oh yeah, because he was on your lap. Yeah, yeah, he was pod. on my lap. He was potting with us. Yeah. He was with us. Good boy. Look at him. He's um, a good boy. He's well, the... I just wants to say hi, guys. He uh he wants some depth. So I'm gonna share it with him. If oh chocolate and beer. Oh, that's like death. <laughs> he thinks he literally can. He literally can't have. Oh, vanilla, vanilla, vanilla. Okay. Barrington, you want some vanilla? Dave, uh, Dave, Dave must have knocked the uh, cancel. He can't have any of these things. No, he kind of wasn't. Did Dave have too much fun? We lost Dave. Dave, Dave yeah, had way too much fun. That's excited about the pup. Right? Yeah. It's okay. Dave's like, fuck that. I'm going to get my dog. Yeah. I'm sure Dave will be. Oh, maybe his phone died. Okay, Thank man. you, babe. Um, his phone already died. Yo, yeah. I think it died. I think what he had did before, he had his wife uh, plugged into the charging port, and then he had to take him out and switch, uh, switch headies. Well, we've so, uh, smashed your two-hour limit, so I mean, I guess that's part oh, of it. Oh, I don't have a limit. Fuck, dude. We did it when we did Third Moon. <laughs> we did five hours with Third Moon in uh, 2020. So, you know. So I got to tell you, those guys. I mean, it's it's similar to this conversation we're having right now. The 
when you meet people, there's always this like feeling out guard phase. When Dave and I met Bebo and Chris, we sat exactly. down straight to it. Right now, yeah, absolutely. It, it was just the most incredible feeling, and that's what I said earlier when I was talking about here in Detroit or anywhere, really, the craft beer options are everywhere. I don't have to seek it out. They seek me out. Yeah. And so when you decide who you want to give your money to, it's the people that you connect with. Yes. You can't find a bad beer. It's almost impossible. No. Not but like after a meeting, if, if, I, if I ever went to Canada, if the next time I go to Canada, I'm stopping at Third Moon a thousand percent. I mean, there's no way I'm going to drive past Milton. Impossible. You'd be ridiculous not to now. Like now that you know that, like you said, it's about the people, right? And there's very few dicks in craft beer, I find, and I imagine it's the same. I don't. I haven't really met anyone that I I didn't like really appreciate or respect. I never found. And like, you, know, it, you know what I mean? I imagine it's the same for you. I, yeah, no, it, it it has been the same for me, and it's funny because. Uh, I love memes, as most people do, uh, and a lot of the memes about crappy people are how difficult they are, or how picky they are, or how annoying they are. And I guess to the outside, maybe that's the case, but in the inside, I, very few and far between, like you said. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm sitting here right now is because the people in the community, like Dave, are so great. I, I've never worked in a brewery. I've never brewed a beer. I've never sold a beer, but you know, here you and I are. And I think that's a testament to the community. I couldn't agree more. And I'm in the, the same position. Never, I've home brewed, but never uh, professionally brewed, never sold beer. Dave's back. Um, third wave Dave. Oh. Third wave, look at him coming oh, through. Oh, there's dogs. There you go. Now we got like Barry could have had a mate. Oh, yeah. Good boy. Yes. That's a good boy right there. Is it a go? <laughs> no, I don't know what the hell happened. That's okay. We we in the building. Technology yeah. happened. Um, we're back. We, I think we we're just talking about we're, Zach and I were just talking about the like how good beer people are, and I find that like I just always have great conversations with beer people, and kind of like what you guys were just saying about how immediate it was um, with Chris and Bebo for you guys, which was my assumption knowing you all. Except Zach, I didn't know you, but I knew if you're a friend of Dave's, you'd be you'd be in the same vibe. I knew that you guys would get along. Like, I knew it wouldn't be a question. It would blow my fucking mind if you didn't. And my experience in Michigan, in California, in New York, in Vermont, in Virginia, in Colorado, all the different places we've gone for beer, you know, back in Australia, and being that I haven't, I don't, don't I haven't lived there for a long time. Like, it's the same, like, it's this immediate click. And I feel like, because we speak the same language, we understand. We're not guessing what we're all talking about. We know we're all fucking beer nerds. Like you were saying earlier, talking about if you listen to this podcast, there's some form of beer nerd just like us. You a nerd being someone who's very in, you know, into something. We all are. You can speak the language, you can converse. They the people involved in beer often at least you know the owners that I told you they're entrepreneurs, so I have a little something in common with them there. There's like this passion for it, like that we all share regardless of what you're doing, whether you're like Zach and I on the outside, like on the perimeter of beer, whether you're like Dave or you're like working in beer. Um, we all have, we all share that. And it's sort of this immediate thing. And I think that that's why I've done this podcast for so long and kept getting fatter because of beer. Because it's fucking great. The people are awesome. Look, we're all just you know, living it and trying to get rid of it. But, you know, it's one of those things. And it's yeah, like, Dave, when you were out, C and I were talking about how easy it was for us to talk to Bebo and Chris. Like we walked in, and yeah. that was it. Mm. Can you hear? I can hear. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 We're good. Yeah. So like, just how easy it was for you guys to to chat and stuff. And I just think that's it's something that like people maybe don't even talk about enough. That 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 ease of communication, regardless of the borders, and you know, fortunately, we all speak the same language, but. You know, there are slight cultural differences between, you know, I came from Quebec into Ontario, pretty different, you know, like even if you look at Michigan right. to Vermont to New York to Maine to whatever, Massachusetts, like it's, you know, you're all American, you're all beer people, but there's subtle differences, but there's still some, this 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 immediacy that that is like a consistently beautiful thing across beer that, uh, I imagine we're all pretty grateful for it. It keeps us all traveling because if it wasn't like that, it'd be a lot harder to 
warrant spending I like money that right there. Places. It keeps us all traveling. And, like, that's the thing. I'll travel for any reason. But when I'm traveling, I have at least one specific mission. It's to find who's making what beer and what kind of people are they. And that's the best. And that was why our, that's why our Canadian trip, and I know we've talked about it on repeat, but it's a Canadian podcast. That's why it was so much fun. Dave and I, and, and you and Dave, there's this friendship connection. But outside of that, when we went to Third Moon, we never met those guys before. We went to Badlands. We never met them before. Obviously, you were there. But it, again, it didn't matter. It was the most natural thing. And it was just, we had a blast. Even after, before and after the microphones were on and off, they showed us their adjunct facility. We did all kinds of different things. And it was, like I said, we, we hung out with Bebo and Chris the next day. Like it was not because we had to, not for us, but because they were cool and it was fun. And by the way, I, I think I told Dave that they specifically. I was talking to Bebo, and he's like, hey, man, he didn't have to say this. He was like, hey, thanks again for connecting us with Zach and Dave. Like, they were fucking awesome. We really love the podcast. Like, he went out of his way to say that to me. So I was like, all right. So it's mutual, once again, Absolutely. not surprised. And it's just like, yeah, I, I guess the, the message in all of this is just that beer people, typically 90-something percent of people are fucking awesome. And it's just, uh, you know, if, if you mean it and you're really into it and there's that passion there, like, how can you not have a good experience with people? It's, it's, it's been like that for me. It sounds like it's been like that for you guys wherever you've been, whether it's locally, within the country, outside the country. It's just uh, it's a great fucking thing, man. It's, it keeps us all, all into it. And um, it's like a never-ending discovery. It's like a pretty cool, yet dangerous, but, you know, super fun hobby that is also, uh, you know, I take it very seriously. Obviously, you guys take it very seriously too. So it's uh, it's very fucking cool. I want to wrap up on if anyone here, you know, we've got listeners obviously everywhere, but you know, predominantly our audience is between Ontario and Quebec. If we have anyone there who's looking to come to Michigan, being that it's like you know, Detroit's like four hours from Toronto, um, a little bit further from Quebec. But if you're kind of cruising, do you guys have some suggestions? Obviously. People need to go through Brew Detroit. What should people be checking out if they're going to go to Michigan if the Canadian's coming down? All right, Dave, kick it off, and I'll clean up the messes and the gaps. <laughs> uh, so for me, uh, I'm going to go with uh, – I'm not even going to mention uh, Brew Detroit in this. Um, I'll we'll go, go with there. Batch. They go there. Batch Brewing. I mean, yeah, you should go, but it, like, for me, like as a, as a beer nerd, like, as we were just saying – you want to go to Batch Brewing Company, you probably want to, if you have the time, it's about a three hour, three and a half hour drive from Detroit, but you want to go to Watermark over in Stevensville. They're they're closer to uh, the Indiana and Illinois borders of Michigan on the west side of the state. Okay. Um, you go up to Grand Rapids and hit City Build. And then uh, if you can get up to the Upper Peninsula, you probably want to hit Barrel and Beam. All right. Okay. My three, uh, going going Barrel, around where the state is. Berlin, Berlin Beam is nuts. I'm a big fan. Um, so yeah. if it's if it's me, um, and we were talking earlier about areas, right? Like places where you can hit more than one. And I think if you're coming to uh, Michigan, especially if you're coming from Port Huron, um, St. Clair Shores is a place where you should check out. There's a variety of breweries between uh, Dragon's Landing. Jamex, Copper Hop, and they're all in really close proximity with a district where you can meander and and drink. So, I mean, I'm with Dave. All the places he said are great, but they're they're vastly spread out. And if you're going to uh, the southwest corner of Michigan, remember you're not far from Three Floyds, if that's what you're into. Um, yep. So, so yeah, I mean, and I think if, if you're going to stay close um, in Detroit, I mean, he already said Batch. Um, I'll shout out Loaded Dice. I'll shout out North Center Brewing. Uh, and these are good people that make good beer. And you, know, you mentioned uh, Liberty Street Brewing, mm -hmm. a little off the path, but something you liked. And so, you know, I, I would suggest if you want to find the good stuff, stand and go to Brew Detroit, go to Batch. But, you know, don't be afraid to wander off the path a little bit. Love it. Yeah. I feel like it's an exciting time to uh, just come check out Michigan Beer and let's, you know, 
you want to go to the Grails, I guess Bells and um, and fucking uh, what's the other one I was thinking of? I guess we can't really say Founders. Well, yeah, you can. I guess it's sort of. Oh, are they still cancelled? Uh, I don't know. Oh, they're cancelled. They're yeah. terrible. Which is sucks for them. I know yeah, we, I mean, had a, we had a good experience with the interview with them, but yeah, yeah I understand. It's pretty pretty crazy what went down. Uh, so I mean, for for Canadian beer drinkers who are really interested for being so close to the border, I mean, Michigan is number six in the country for the number of breweries and as far as states go. So if you want to, you know, uh, hit one of the the top top six top 10 breweries or states for breweries in the United States. Just come right over the border, get over the ambassador bridge, come through the tunnel, come visit Michigan. No, don't go over the bridge. Go through the tunnel. David, I learned that the hard way. Yeah. Don't use the, the bridge. Tunnel. tunnel. We went, went, uh, we went for the bridge for the, the gram. <laughs> right. We wanted the, we wanted the gram. We wanted the videos. It is nice. Yeah. It's not worth it. No. Yeah. yeah but moment. it took us like an no. hour to get across. And it was like 30 yeah. seconds to get across the fucking tunnel. <laughs> I remember yeah, that. We came back. The tunnel was like, oh man, we should have, we should have came through the tunnel. But uh, no, I we mean, couldn't find it. We couldn't find it. <laughs> I mean, I knew, I knew where, I knew where it was, but I was like, we need better shots for Instagram. Sometimes you no, gotta take the, way the back. Out. We couldn't oh. find the tunnel. Oh, that yeah, all on the way back, yeah. That took. Dude, we drove around for like a half an hour trying to find the entrance to the tunnel. It's wild. You're trapped was, in Canada. Though. I was like, God, no. They live on poutine. They don't want you to, they want, don't no, want you to leave. Do that. They don't want you to leave, Dave. They need you to stay. No. Cheese, curds, and gravy. It's probably one of the greatest things to come out of this uh, fine land over here, you know? It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And Tom Green. Yeah. Hell yeah. I mean, you know, what can I say? Dead mouse. Dead mouse. Yeah, It's right. the best. Boys, this has been fucking awesome. Thank you oh. both for uh, hanging out. It was great to just shoot the shit, crush some fire beers. Um, you're both amazing. Where can everyone find Brew Detroit online? And then obviously if either of you want to be found individually, please let us know. Uh, BrewDetroit.com is the website. Uh, at BrewDetroit is Instagram uh, because of some fuckery. Uh, Detroit, at Detroit Brew is Twitter. And then uh, Brew Detroit on Facebook. And then obviously the Brew Detroit podcast on Spotify. And, uh, I mean, I am DC underscore Juggernaut on Instagram. You can find me there. Uh, that's pretty much it for Detroit. Love Stack. it. Oh, yeah. I mean, for me, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at the Brewman Chew. And on the Twitters, I am Zach with an H, Zach E. Clark, if you're curious. Love it. Please follow uh, Brew Detroit and both the boys. Uh, we're going to grab a screenshot for uh, the thumbnail. So if you would like to yes. hold up some... Uh, Can I make the face? If you would be so inclined, that would be oh, glorious. Yeah. I got to get up uh, from my uh, spot and grab one of these cans real quick. I should have enough juice here. We'll see what happens. Juice it up. We're almost done. You got this. You ready? Oh, it's Dave ready. Ready, boys? Stunning. Um, I'm going to wrap this up and then we'll say goodbye off air. So just stick around, uh, after I wrap it up, uh, boys, once again, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to hang with you both. Uh, you're just fucking champions. Um, guys, please make sure you check out Brew Detroit, check out Dave and Zach personally as well. And, uh, you know, if you're in Canada or even if you're just elsewhere in the U S and not from Michigan, you know, I feel like there's no better time. We're coming to the fall. It's leaf peeping season right here. You know, it's a beautiful part of the country beautiful part of the continent you know there's dogs there's beer there's hairy men i mean what more do you need uh guys thank you so much for watching and listening if you enjoyed the episode smash the thumbs up hit subscribe below and hit the notification bell so you know when the new new drops follow us everywhere at bos podcast and check out the long form audio we're on spotify apple Podcasts, everywhere hit those five stars because as zach and dave know that, that changes the game for everybody and um we're uh we're back in fucking content mode right now we're, we're pumping them out so we're back every week we will see you next week y'all get it in ya.